We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Possibly the last episode for Tom for a little while. I, we're not certain if you're going to sneak in next week or not. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll, we'll find see out. We'll see how... how l- let me just say... Well, first of all, let's let's always preface these stories with I love my wife. All right. <laughs> let's just always preface those stories with a reminder that this is that 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 there is no ill intent here or ill will going yes. on. It's just a statement of fact and that is my wife freaks the heck out right before <laughs> We do anything like okay. as big as what we're doing, which is yeah. this, but like, like the one of the biggest fights we've ever had was <laughs> on the way to my my son's first the first birthday party we threw where we invited people to go to a place and we were going to meet them there okay. and not enough people had RSVP'd mm-hmm. and she was freaking out and uh, she she doesn't handle stress well so <laughs> it, I mean she does it's just I. She feels very comfortable <laughs> with me, okay, and making sure I know how stressed she is. Understood. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> yes. Anyways, so she is. Uh, she is. Uh, there's a good chance that there is going to be far too much stress in this house, mm-hmm. and a lot of yelling. And why haven't you packed yet? And mm-hmm. what do you mean you don't have enough underwear? Mm. Uh, you you, you can't purchase sort of underwear thing. pretty much anywhere you go in the world. So it's really not. This is not. This is immaterial. <laughs> Rob, this is immature. My, so my packing chances are I... we are leaving on Wednesday. We record yes. on Tuesday. The yeah. chances are I I am just anticipating right. that there may be a conflict. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. day. Yep. So could be my my. Uh, I don't travel very much, but my travel advice for everybody is yeah, d- d- don't don't ever check a bag ever if you can avoid it. Well, we don't and, have a choice. We're going to have to. Yeah. we're going for two. We're going to be gone for too long. And one of the ways you one of the ways you can do that is uh, just don't pack anything that can be easily purchased wherever you're going, which is. Your toiletries, underwear, socks, undershirts, what you can get those anywhere for dirt cheap. Yeah. You don't have to bring them back. Who cares? They're disposable. And no. yeah, just don't pack that stuff. <laughs> so we're going to. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds I, like. I, because it's it's one thing to buy a pair of socks or uh, three pairs of socks or something like that. We're going to be gone for the better part of a month yeah. in a foreign country yeah. and uh, tra- a couple of foreign countries. Mm-hmm. And we do not travel the way that most people travel okay now this okay. if you are a planner i need you to either steal yourself for what i'm about to say mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or fast forward mm-hmm. <laughs> because you do not want to hear what i'm about to tell you which gotcha. is we have tickets to get to london yeah okay so we are going to to my cousin's wedding in san francisco and from san francisco we're going to london from london we are going to turkey right uh we currently have no tickets or anything to get us from London to Turkey. Gotcha. And we don't know actually what we're going to do. My wife has changed the plan like 17 times. <laughs> the most recent iteration is we are taking the train to France, renting a car and driving to Belgium. and then oh. No, driving to Germany. Belgium was in there for a while. We are now driving to Germany where we will fly from... Oh. Munich or whatever Frankfurt whatever the big airport is mm-hmm. there and then fly from there to uh Turkey at some point right. and uh then we'll have to get a ticket that gets us back to London at some cuz we have tickets mm-hmm. back from London I but see. um there's a lot of there's a lot of not <laughs> planning going on we have no place to stay in Turkey I mean at least we're getting there. around through the EU is right. a relatively you can do that type of thing that's yeah. that's not too bad so i um and, and I don't care. We will be fine. I, I Believe me, we have rolled into cities, into countries, no less, uh, when my wife and I were traveling with no plans on where we're going to go or where we're going to stay. Mm-hmm. We've made terrible mistakes that <laughs> we almost had to sleep outside for a night and stuff like that. And get, we didn't die. You know, I mean, not that that's the yardstick by which we should measure, but... <laughs> We just don't plan like that. Okay. Like some people need to be at resorts and you sure, know exactly sure. where they're going to be. We don't. And we know that, you know, I mean, worst case scenario, we just find a hotel and then 
Yeah. I'm like, okay, well, well I mean, once, we're overpaying for this hotel. But once you're can't. out of London onto the mainland of Europe, I mean, you're yeah, then you're all one fine. continent, so it's yes, can't be that yes, bad. Should be fine. <laughs> should be fine. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, I know you saw the the title of the podcast episode, which means that we will be talking about the status between three A and C. Uh, earphones or headphones. What I don't was even, know I, what to even call I didn't catch that, and I'm looking at it. What did you just say? Status. Status between, between three. E- three A and C is the name of the things. Okay. Okay. I will give you a quick preview, but we're not going to talk about them yet. We're going to talk about them just after we talk about what we watch. Sure. Okay. But if you don't like the name of these things, uh-huh. you know where I started with this podcast with this review. Why I would they name it the between? But it's not the, the the other ones they have are called the status between pro between pro and what right, I don't know yeah. but that's what they're called between a, I guess it's supposed to be your heads between them I don't know what the between is supposed to that be. is a really strange name to choose for a product it is there's a lot of strangeness going on I have on to here. assume so, the three ANC is active noise canceling but I'm not sure what the three refers to anyway there's three teaser. microphones there's three head th- the three drivers in each headphone that's gotcha what, I'm pretty sure okay. that's what it called stands for. Anyways, we were going to talk about them in a second, okay. but before that, let's talk about what we watched. Rob, sure. what did you watch? Uh, truly nothing, and I mean, when I say that, I, I'm i struggling to think if I even turned my TV on this with past week. I, I, wow. don't know, I don't know what happened exactly. I can't really point to any particular big plan that kept me from watching TV this week, but I was thinking back, like, yeah, I don't I don't even know if I turned on my TV, so I, I saw some of the NHL playoff highlights. I didn't watch a single game all the way through, it just... just Picked it up in the highlights, and I, I think that's about I like when I say nothing, I didn't even keep up with the couple of TV shows I normally watch. Like I didn't watch any Battle Bots, I didn't watch any Survivor, and like that's about all I'm watching on actual Survivor. network TV you watch anymore. Survivor? I still watch Survivor. That's I've never watched Survivor. I haven't seen <laughs> a single not... episode of that show. For my TV whole life. watching, I like stuff that I can put on and not have to pay much attention to, and that fits the uh, bill. It's perfectly it's reasonable to have I, on. I, I, I'd rather pay attention to a blank screen than watch right. Survivor. I'll be honest with so, you. So yeah, but I didn't. I didn't me. watch the most recent episode of Barry, which was that the season finale? I, anyway, yeah, I didn't watch anything. So there you go. That was me this week. I have nothing to recommend. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Uh, so Ant Man Three, Quantum Mania, whatever it's yes. called, you know, uh, came out on Disney Plus. It did. Uh oh, and you know what? I didn't write it on here, but I did watch the. the I finished Willow finally. Oh, good thing so, you did. We'll um, have a new story about that. <laughs> yes, I know we will. I will say, as not good as it is uh-huh. and i i can't stress enough that it is not like they they just literally said things to each other in the final episode where like i was like you've never mentioned that before you can't say okay. that you guys have always said that you've never said it i mean i don't think you've ever said that i don't remember this conversation and then you're like you're like referencing back to something <laughs> not and i don't want to like sneak evidence really into your closing arguments <laughs> <laughs> it's not really a spoiler, I guess, but they're like, you know, love is the greatest power of all or something like that. They sure. like, uh, you know what I always say? That love is the greatest power of all? Yes. I'm like, no, you don't. No, you didn't. What are you talking about? You've never said that. Did they that. say Have that in the original that? movie, maybe? I is don't know, but it wasn't the same characters anyway, so okay. who gives a crap? Mm. So um, <laughs> I, I am upset that there's not going to be another season of this stuff. Indeed, I yeah. mean, I, I really mu- very much feel like it is not so bad it's good, but it's yeah. so bad it's fun. Or okay. so fun you give you don't care that it's bad. It's just I was just thinking while you're saying that. You weren't here when I talked about it, but that that is like exactly how I'm feeling about Gem and the Holograms, the the movie version that came out ah. a few years ago. I talked about that with Lee and I'm like, that is exactly what it is. Like, is it just objectively not good? Yes. It's not so bad that it's good, no. and yet there's something strangely <laughs> compelling about it where I think about Everyone it from time to time. Everyone is so committed to <laughs> this story, <laughs> right? All the actors are just like, I am committed to this, and I, you feel like, all right, I'm going to yeah. go along with you. And yeah, then yeah, yeah. The, the, the cognitive dissonance or the visual dissonance of having the bad guys be absolute nightmare fuel yeah right like out of nowhere like, so, like, like people just... did put effort into this show behind they the scenes did. in the cam- in front of the camera behind the camera like yeah <laughs> you can see it yeah. you can feel it i'm like right. like nothing works yeah. <laughs> like the dialogue doesn't work but this wasn't like just from pure lack of intention or no. or trying like they no they tried it just didn't they tried work. 
And I, you know, I mean, I, I don't think there's any one thing that I can look, I can point at and say this is the problem. I mean, the writing's kind of okay. iffy here or there, and 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 like I said, there's the 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 tone is all over the place. Okay. But you, the whole time you, you you spend watching it, you're like, this is not very good. <laughs> But you don't look away, <laughs> so I don't know what to I do mean, about hey, this. As far as the show. studios are concerned, Chat GPT is going to fix all of that. So, oh God, yeah. help us all. Uh, so yes, Willow season two should definitely happen. Uh, all, the fact that I know that we're going to talk about it in a second, yeah, the fact that we're taking it off in Disney Plus, highly unlikely. <laughs> it's not not great, not great. I am I am tempted to go out and buy the DVD blu-ray version or whatever they will VHS there be they one on. i don't think there will be one that is that is going to be part of the news too we're teasing so many things for coming up oh well anyways i haven't read that uh, mm-hmm. article because i was mad at it anyway so i did watch the new ant-man movie Kay. it's fine <laughs> there you go all right <laughs> i'll be honest with you like okay I got so angry at how often they took their helmets off in the midst of mm. battle, just mm-hmm. so you could see the actors' faces. Yeah. That I was like, "Come, can we just not?" It's the can we opposite can of the Mandalorian? Put, <laughs> can you just put your freaking helmet back on? You know, it's like uh, you know, I'm, I, you're right. people are shooting at you, helmets on. Mm. Like, no, I, I know you want to talk to your daughter or wife or whatever she is. I don't even know what hope is in this stupid series, but you know, <laughs> girlfriend, whatever, mom, dad. I understand that you want to talk to them. They can hear you with the helmet on. They can hear you. You have like microphones in it. Should and, be like, able to, speakers. yeah. Yeah. And they talk so, to each but, other across great distances through wireless technology that still works within the quantum realm somehow. <laughs> no one cares. So. No one cares. No one cares. No one cares about your science. Believe me, the problems are much bigger than that. So th- it was fine. It's like certainly better than Thor 2. Let's just okay. let's just put that out sure, there. Yeah, it's okay. better than yeah, that. Dark world. It yeah, has gotcha. a very... Uh, like. I, I wish that Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy had been made like by whatever graphical team that did this mm-hmm. one because it had that, that that very like there's an alien species for everything yes, kind of right. feel feel to it which I liked. Uh, King the Conqueror he did a uh, the actor Jonathan Majors did a great job right uh, who's uh, now yeah seemingly very problematic in the real yeah, world I so know. they kind of committed to that character as being a I bit of know. a big deal we're gonna yeah. see what that plays out we're with gonna all see of that where that's gonna go i mean yeah so but that, it's not like they haven't like teased something and gone like eh, oh yeah that. i know, you know yeah. so and there's certainly um there's certainly other villains or somebody else you could just like upstage him real quick if they really wanted to. I mean, they it's did like see the next, of, show next Avengers is going to be the Kang Dynasty, so that's, that could that change. Could, that 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 might change, yes. But uh, yes, I thought that um, overall it was it was fine. Okay. You know, I, I told my wife you don't need to watch this one. You know, yeah, there's just a lot of. A lot of fighting, a lot of battles. I mean, you and I of... often disagree on our takes on movies, but this one we feel much the same. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not mad that I saw it. It's also just like, uh huh. <laughs> I did like Catherine Newton though. I thought she was like the uh, the one bit of nice energy in that movie. Everyone who, else who seemed... was she? She was the daughter. She was Cassie. Oh, Cassie. Yes, yeah. I thought she was fun too. Okay, she was. Good. I didn't know that. But a lot of people were like, "How can you change the actor?" For I'm like, shut yeah. up. All of you, shut up. None of you care. None of you who are complaining about things before movies come out care about the things you're complaining about. You just want to get clicks, so yeah. you're complaining. That's all you're doing. And then, or you're list, or you somebody else told you to be mad, and now you're being mad. Absolutely. Shut up! You don't care. You do not care. No. Ariel can be. So enough she of wants all that. We've got a review to get to. Yes, yeah, so let's you let's talk about the status between three A and C earphones or headphones or whatever we're calling. What I guess earphones are the ones that go in your ears, yeah. and headphones go around or something. That's I, usually the way I I delineate them. You can find the review over AV Gadgets. I go into excruciating detail about all this. Let's just start from my own personal perspective. Um, yeah, Yes, the name is weird. I didn't really think that much about it until I started writing it down over and over again as part of the or review. Or just and saying like, it out loud. It is yeah. a strange name. It is a strange name. But the thing that got me about these, these earphones when I first started testing them was I wore them outside and people were like, well, they're ugly. Gotcha. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the that's the really short version. And of... you gotta do something these days to get any sort of like actually noticing and commenting about earphones because I mean everybody's yes. kind of used to the stems sticking out of people's ears right. or whatever. So for those of you that are looking at the YouTube video, if not, mm-hmm. you can go to the thing. They they are square or rectangular. Okay, the outside of them are rectangular. And but the the, the thing that they don't show you, and I I kind of do this in the um in the review, is they always show them from like. 
like a right angle, like directly mm-hmm. the side of your face, perpendicular to the side of your face. So they look like they're coming out of your ear and they look pretty normal. Except if you look from the side, you know, they are very deep. Like mm-hmm. they are quite deep. Now there's three drivers in here. There's two, um, what do you call them? Uh, armature, balanced armature mm-hmm. drivers, mm-hmm. which are for the uh, to trouble in mid-range, and then one regular old driver for all the bass. And they... This is, and the saving grace of these headphones is that they sound very good. Okay. They are very good sounding headphones. Probably some of the best I've ever heard. Mm. Uh, full stop. So they certainly put a lot of effort into making these sound good. And if you look at their marketing, first of all, they only compare themselves to uh, other white earphones, which are, of course, <laughs> the AirPods. Yes. Right? And uh, the AirPods sound like garbage. Everybody knows that. That's not really this. You know, that's setting the bar pretty low. But they, yeah, they have a 10 millimeter dynamic driver, which is a regular driver, and then a couple of balanced armature drivers to do, handle. And that is, gives you much more detail in the top end than you, in the mid-range than you would really expect. Okay. Uh, they are a little base forward. I, that's no doubt about that. Uh, and, I mean, really the praise of these headphones begins and ends with their sound quality. Okay. It is, they are, they have very good sound quality and they're good. I guess let's not say begins and ends because their marketing is also phenomenal. Like I get, I, <laughs> maybe it's because I was doing the review and searching for them, but um, my targeted ads are a thousand uh, right. <laughs> okay. percent of these things. Right. So I see them constantly. Uh, so th- their marketing is also very good, but um you know, the app has a very good look to it, mm-hmm. but it's, like, not great. Okay. I mean, it, it, it just, it makes you go through way more screens, which, it, the number of screens that you should have to go through to to access the, you know, the front page of the app for the headphones that you are currently wearing mm-hmm. is at maximum one. Mm-hmm. You should have to maybe choose them, right? There's, like, two or three that you got to get through on this mm-hmm. thing. You got to open it up. It's going to, it's going to say take them out of the case. I'm like, this screen that you're saying, take them out of the case does not come up unless one of them is out of the case. Like, Interesting. Unle- unless the earphone is connected to your phone via, via ah, Bluetooth, right. your, this, the, the app will just say, will just not, open. I mean, it won't, <laughs> won't do anything. So this is dumb. And then you have to pass that. You have to say, do you like, there's another thing, another screen you have to go through and click connect or mm-hmm. something to get mm-hmm. into them. It's dumb. And then, you know, there's no battery indicator anywhere on the app or on your phone that I could find for my phone that will tell you how much battery is left on the case. Mm-hmm. They'll tell you how much battery is left on the earphones, mm-hmm. but not the case, which is also very dumb. So I am, you know, overall, that <laughs> side of it, like all the rest of it, the usability is not very good, gotcha. or at least needs this company screams startup to me. And mm-hmm. I, you know, hey, everybody starts somewhere. They can certainly improve these things. There are certainly ways of updating the app and, you know, maybe adding some of these things or, you know, streamlining some of them. But the real problem is, is that they look dumb. Okay, so I'm going to take my okay. headphones off, which means I will no longer be able to hear Rob. But That's fine. what's happening. Uh, and I'm going to put these in. Okay, so at least one of them in. So there's one of them in. If you're looking at the, the thing, you can see here. I'll put Rob up to my ear. Okay. You can see how <laughs> m- far out of my ear they stick. Now, there right. could be other ears that are not this much, that do not, not, not stick out this far. But the, yeah, I mean, but it is yeah, it is the sh- it's the shape and the design of it. Like having like a Bluetooth earpiece in, like yeah. it's not it's not miles away from that. If you're never going to see the images that we're talking about, but yeah, it it really does look like a USB thumb drive or yes, or, uh, exactly or a USB like. dongle. It looks like you've got yeah. a USB dongle stuck into your ear. That's really that's what exactly it looks what like. it looks like. Yes, I'm going to take it out now. Put my yeah. headphones back on. So the problem here, of course, is you know. That is literally the first thing every everybody who saw these headphones said to uh, me. They're like, "Why do you have a flash drive sitting out of your eye, ear?" Right. I'm like, "Yeah." Well, in, in, <laughs> in all honesty, if they added that functionality to this, I'd be like, "That's kind of cool." <laughs> yeah. But it's of course not there. This you know, all the space is taken up. You know, they talk about their battery life. Their battery life is no better than anybody else. It's not that great. Yeah. Um, but they do sound very good. Mm. So if what you're really looking for mm-hmm. is like the best possible sound for a reasonable amount of money, these things are about 200 bucks, 250 bucks. I don't remember. I said 250, uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah. They are, um, yeah, 250. Mm. They are, they sound very good. Mm. Uh, do they, are they the best 200? I haven't heard every other, every, an ear, 
I don't know. These are very good compared to all the other ones I have. Uh. And I really, I really went into these, especially once I saw them on me and, you know, kind of played around with the app and stuff like that. I was like, ugh, hmm. I don't, I don't want to give them a good review. But I couldn't. I couldn't not give them at least Praise that they sound, the sound very, very good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's other things that they, they can do better. And I think that, you know, certainly this is, I think this is their second pair of headphones that mm-hmm. I saw on their website. The first one being the pros, uh, which are cheaper than these three <laughs> ANC. And the other thing is too, the <laughs> ANC performance. I'm so tired. Uh, right. Yes. I am so tired of everybody saying we've got the best ANC. No, you don't. It's all the same. Mm-hmm. There is like, I, I mean, I was like, oh, these, the, I, I was comparing. I, I put them in. I turned on the ANC. I was weed whacking and going, eh, that's kind of OK. Mm-hmm. But it's because it, the weed whacker is a very higher pitched sound. Okay. And it wasn't really cutting it out all that much. It mm. was deadening it, but not that much. But then it was really doing good on the lawnmower, which was further mm-hmm. away from me because uh, my son was using that. Uh and I was like, oh, okay, well, eh, that kind of okay, whatever. And then I, I'm like, I wonder how it compares to some of my other ones. They're all about the same. Right. <laughs> like, all of them are, are about the same. You know, so I compared, like, three or, three or four different headphones all together. And I was like, yeah, it's kind of what they do. That's what ANC sounds like. Yeah. It, 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 ANC is not magic. You know, no. there is – I'm sure that you can get, like, super duper high-tech good ANC. And it's wonderful, but, you know, it's – with most of these headphones, they all sound about the same. It's inverse um, sine wave generation. That's, that's it's not, all it it's is. It's not brain surgery. No. Uh, and the real problem, I mean, again, going back to the usability, they have two different ways of controlling the thing. They have a button, a physical button on like the top of the USB drive. Mm-hmm. I'm going to call it that so yeah. they can suck it. And they have like the capacitance touch on the side, yeah. right? Well, that button on the top you know, you're like, ooh, a physical button. That must be nice. It gets that physical feedback. Well, either I have the deadest fingers in the world, which is certainly possible because I do climb, but uh, or you know, this button has no tactile feedback that I can really sense. And it's like one press, two press, three presses. Mm. And let me tell you about two and three presses. They ain't kidding. You better be quick. Mm-hmm. This is like, you know, you got the. I'm telegraph also thinking like, how do you tap that without accidentally touching the capacitive part on the side? It's, but not easy. Pretty it's close not proximity. Even, to be honest with you, yeah. they're right there. Yeah, because it's not the metal part at the bottom that yeah, you saw. Yeah, it was yeah. it's, it's the it's the plastic part at the top. So uh, and then it's uh, like it flips one of the controls there, which are not non configurable. You cannot change the controls, mm. which a lot of apps will let you do. Uh, is the, the one of the 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 things is to change between uh, the ambient mode and the uh, the uh, auto noise canceling mode, mm-hmm. right? And the problem is, is those are the only, it just like once you press that button or even accidentally press that button, it switches you into one of those two modes. I can't remember which one goes first. And then you can switch to the other one and then you can switch to the first one and back and forth, but you can't get out. Yeah, you can't unless get the go- noise canceling off. <laughs> That's not a yeah, third Yeah, you can't option. just turn it off. In fact, there's a – it's and I didn't mention this in the review. You know, usually they have some sort of female voice uh, yeah. that, that kind of talks to you, Siri-esque yeah. sounding. Uh, this is not. This is just some dude. And, it's, <laughs> and I got no problems with that. But, you know, what? <laughs> like, it, he, he just said – I don't know. It, it – it, it threw me off the first couple of times. Right. And every time I heard that, I was like, Ugh. I'm not saying he's a bad voice actor or maybe he's just one of the, the crew or whatever. And right. He has a f- nice tenor to his voice, tenor to his voice. But it's just, I don't know. I never really, it, I never really liked it, if that okay. makes sense. It didn't really feel helpful. It mo- felt more, a little, a little judgmental. I don't know. <laughs> but he, uh, and he just tells you, uh, ambient or uh, and ANC mode on. Mm-hmm. And ambient and ANC mode off, right? Those are like the or in headphones connected. Maybe you might say as well, but uh, very. It's just kind of like they like like nah. It doesn't switch. Like when you switch between the two, it doesn't say anything. It just gives you like this noise, this kind of this chime that lets you know which one you're on. Mm-hmm. Which if if you do it enough, you'll remember which one is associated with which one. But I didn't because I always turn it off. Uh, but you have to turn it off from the app. And yeah. when you turn it off, then he pops into your ear telling you that you turn the whole thing off. It's very strange. Anyway, okay. so. Well, yeah, it's not a glowing review, no, but it, it it's certainly not a n- I just, negative. I have review. to think for that price, though, there are other headphones that still sound good and do all of these other all the other better. So, well, and that's yeah. the, that's where I really kind of land is like it's very hard when there's so many like like 
all of these, not all, but many of the headphones I've reviewed from Soundcore, they all use that same app. Yeah. The app is great. Mm. The app is great. It's not, I mean, I think that the looks of the status app was better. Okay. Like it has that sort of white, you know, iPhone looking sure. look that everybody likes so much. And it, the, the, the EQ certainly did something and it had most, most of the functionality I want, but it was just lacking so many of what I think to be fundamental things. Mm. Like, let me get into the... the the, the control part of the app without going through two or three screens, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, let me know the battery of the case, please. Okay. You know, let me have the ability to turn off the, <laughs> and, you know, both the, have an off option on the ANC and the ambient noise mode. Yeah. You know, it's just, there's just so many weird little things. And I, I think that part of marketing or part of be standing out from a crowd is looking different. And these definitely look different. <laughs> yeah. Not in a great way. I don't know that I think that this is that they totally hit the mark there. Now, in the marketing, they look great. Uh, <laughs> All hmm. the actors or act uh, that are or the models that are wearing them look either are taken from the right angle, <laughs> or they must have like the world's deepest ears or something because they <laughs> look great. But um, yeah, I didn't. It didn't look so good on me. So that that's my review. All right, check it out and. Uh, avgadgets.com for okay. more specifics all right this is a uh, av rent the podcast that answers your home theater and av questions so get your questions answered all if you do is ask us by emailing us at question at avrent.com go to our website and find our show notes as well as uh the Flickr album so you can follow along with the pictures that we'll be talking about you can also find us at uh, facebook.com slash av rent podcast youtube.com slash av rant and contact rob directly rob at av rant.com his twitter is at first reflect i am tom at av rant.com and i am not active on twitter mm -hmm. so uh let's thank our listeners of the week to become a listener of the week support the podcast in some way one of the ways you can do that is going to av rant.com click on the buy us a cup of coffee link and send us a paypal donation we did not get any of those this week and we haven't for the last couple of weeks so mm -hmm. i just want to throw that out there that that is an <laughs> option i know summer is upon us yes i know that children's schools are ending mm -hmm. i know there's a lot of stuff going on I know I should. We should be planning a lot more than we are for our vacation. So <laughs> yeah. yes, there's a lot of stuff. I understand that. Just reminding people. We also have our Patreon, uh, Patreon.com/slash/AVRampPodcast, where you can uh, be a monthly contributor to the podcast. Every month, they'll take some money from you and give most of it to us. We have 139 this month, so thank you very much to our 139 patrons. Yeah, that's very nice number. There, 139 patrons over at Patreon.com/slash/AVRampPodcast. That's where you can go to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation. So big thanks to all of our uh, support over there we also uh will mention anybody who supports us in any other way we got uh, travis and julian this this uh week sent in some photos uh with the permissions for me to use them on avgadgets.com i need to start I, I have a whole backlog of photos i need to upload all so. right thank you travis thank you julian yeah, i will get them up on av gadgets thank you travis and julian we also got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going from uh jd toke and I do think that's right. Yeah, it's it's Danish as far as I know. So. All right. So, uh, only recently discovered our podcast thanks to our episode featuring Lee's dual SV2000 Pro subwoofer review and says we're highly entertaining. Thank you. Thank you, Toke. Uh, Travis Julian, who says we're his favorite, favorite podcast. Donald okay. wanted to join in the chorus saying he enjoyed Tom and Lee's recent episode and hoping everything's good with Rob's family members' health concerns. Yes, things are, things are all okay. Stabilized and we're doing all right. Thank you very much. Okay. Junior and Daniel, and Daniel says he loves our YouTube channel, which is he could give two thumbs up to each video. More than one Google account will help you with that, sure. Daniel. So thank you for thanking us, JD, Toke, uh, Travis, Julian, Donald Jr., and Daniel. Thank you. Yes, I'll say the names one more time. JD Toke. I don't know if it's Toke. If it was Asian, maybe it was that. But I'm pretty sure it was. Know. I'm pretty sure yeah. it was uh, the the Scandinavian version. So I think that is just Toke and uh, Travis, Julian, Donald Jr., and Daniel. Thank you all very much for those notes of gratitude and encouragement. They are very much appreciated. And a big thanks to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. All right, we got some. Uh... I guess news. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're going with straight to news. Uh, this one via Daz, our listener. Uh, Send Acoustics has released their new flagship tower speakers, the ELX Series Towers. You can choose the C's Titan Dome tweeters, aluminum uh, magnesium alloy for $4,400 a pair, or the RAL 70 by 20 XRAM 
That's just the name of the t- of the tweeter. <laughs> it's from Ron. Ribbon it's tweeters ribbon. for fifty three hundred a pair. Yeah, these towers use the same laminated bamboo cabinet construction and dimensions as the Sierra Tower speakers. Now selling as the V two versions for three thousand dollars a pair with dome tweeters, or thirty six hundred with the RAL ribbon tweeters. But the front baffle is slightly different to accommodate the new ELX complement of drivers. There's still a rear port, single pair of binding posts, and magnetic grills. I cannot believe they didn't put dual binding posts in there. I mean, hey, uh, Dave doesn't they believe in the co- <laughs> putting stuff on there that doesn't actually do anything. Oh, no, anything. this is a send. I am sorry. Yes. I apologize. And this, I, and I thought this was a Perian. In my head, I went oh, to a Perian, I and I nope, was thinking, nope. why? how can the company that sells you super tweeters not put dual binding no, posts? No, this is a but send. I agree. <laughs> I agree. A send is much more realistic Dave and uh, trusts the crossovers that he is very good at designing <laughs> and uh, doesn't believe there is any particular reason why you would need to artificially separate the crossover that he spent a lot of time designing. Yeah. Yeah. The LX name comes from the fact that these new towers use a 6-inch EX driver that was developed for the Sierra 2 EX V2 speakers as a dedicated mid-range driver, along with two of the 6-inch LX drivers that were developed for the Sierra LX speakers. Everything has been optimized using a sense Kippel measurement uh, system. They are particularly proud of the exceedingly uniform off-axis dispersion that shows almost no change at 10, 20, and 30 degrees off-axis horizontally over the entire frequency range versus the on-axis response. God help us <laughs> for all the people <laughs> that, that are going to say that this is a bad thing and or will still point the speakers directly at their face. Uh, Ascend is self-proclaiming these to, uh, these to be end game speakers suitable even for huge rooms that's owning owing to their uh, 90.5 db to just 2.83 volts one meter sensitivity mm-hmm. in room which they li- also list as a 7.5 anechoic yeah with a listed <laughs> so it's really a 7.5 anyways uh with a listed a ohm nominal impedance and the power handling of 400 watts continuous 600 watts at peak however their own impedance measurements uh indicate it pro- it should be probably spec as a four ohm nominal speaker yeah so for being conservative <laughs> and you have amplifiers capable of delivering at the specified wattage these are still around 15 to 16 foot uh listening distance speakers for full reference volume so maybe huge rooms is pushing it a bit, but regardless, these are the most capable speakers Ascend has ever offered. So, there you go. Yeah, uh, I'm not certain, uh, because the thing is, uh, they're working very closely with Seas uh, out of Norway, uh, who are the the, uh, company that actually physically manufactures the drivers that they use, and Ascend uh, quite heavily... um, uh, modifies uh, any of the C's drivers or, or has them modified by C's to be exactly the parameters that they want. So when they're saying that, you know, they've they've sort of taken the EX series driver that they used in the new Sierra 2 EX version 2 uh, and used that as the dedicated mid-range driver in these new ELX towers and taken the LX driver from their Sierra LX speakers, uh, two of those as the woofers... Um, they they might have customized those just a little bit further uh, for these specific speakers, uh, since those are uh, drivers in Caesar's lineup where they can tweak the parameters of uh, of exactly what's going on there. So it isn't necessarily that they just took the exact same drivers as what's in the Sierra 2 EX and in the Sierra LX and dropped those into these towers. These might be slightly modified. They talk about them being proprietary drivers to this speaker. So uh, that is probably the case where there's slight modifications that have been made there. But uh, basing on a platform now across multiple of their speakers in their lineup. And uh, yeah, uh, some people have been requesting like, hey, can you make, you know, Ascend Acoustics, can you make a speaker that can play even louder than your uh, Sierra Towers and your uh, Sierra Horizon Center? So this is their answer to that, the ELX, some larger mid-range and, uh, and woofer drivers going into those uh, towers. So yeah, have a look out for those. Yeah, I'm looking at the um, impedance graph and it does yeah. dip. For a good portion of the base into 
Yeah. Lower well, than five ohms. Yeah. Also, just the, the way that you're supposed to spec nominal impedance is you look for the low point of the saddle uh, after the point of where the base driver uh, crosses over there. And whatever that dips down to is what you're supposed to spec as the nominal impedance. So that is... That is below 5 ohms. It is definitely yes. not 8. It is definitely yes, not 8. Definitely not 8. The low point yes. of that saddle. <laughs> Unless you're crossing your speaker over at 1 kilohertz. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So Then it's 8, for sure. I mean, I'm sure they want to say it's perfectly fine to use this with a normal AV receiver, because that is the case. It's perfectly fine case. to use these with a normal I, AV receiver. So that's probably why they just threw the 8 ohm number in there, but... It's yeah. interesting that they have a minimum recommended power at listening position yeah. for spe specific <laughs> speaker distances. Like, That's how loud is miles. that? Is that like... It's pretty quiet, well, most of those, honestly. Yeah, 70... You're 21 feet or more away, 72 watts minimum. 72 watts at 21 feet. It's not very loud. I don't think it's no. very loud. I mean, I think so. that's hitting your sort of like 85 dB, you know, going on yeah. there. But if you then want to get up to the 105 dB peaks for movies, uh, you're going to struggle. So, yeah. So interesting looking uh, speakers. I certainly uh, respect the sound, and uh, it is I, I. It is kind of funny that these some of these specs numbers are a little bit questionable. A little bit fudgy, which is yeah, we wouldn't totally expect that from them. That's yeah, unusual. I generally don't expect that from them. I expect that from a lot of other people. Oh, but I don't yeah. necessarily, necessarily expect it from them. <laughs> but these do look like very, and I trust that they are now. I love those bamboo cabinets, by the way. Those, I those do are my too. favorite thing. They're wonderful. I do too. I will tell you though that there is something, and and a lot of you out there who are uh, really into audio, really into home theater, really into all this stuff, are probably going to feel the same. Speakers with exceedingly flat off-axis response that that mirrors or you know equates to exact to the on-axis response mm -hmm. are phenomenal. Let me just say that are <laughs> phenomenal. OK, they are also frustratingly boring when you are trying to point set them, them anywhere up. you want. Pretty much. <laughs> you, know, you, just, you just get like, I'm going to play with the toe and you play with the toe and yeah. everything sounds exactly the same. Right. And you're like, well, this sucks. I didn't have to do anything. I don't I mean, these are like brain dead speakers. Throw them at the front yeah. of the room. They don't even have to be pointing in the same direction. You would anticipate them to be not terribly picky about toe-in. That would be the anticipation. <laughs> like one's straightforward, one's towed in a little bit. And, and, then, and then people are like, your speakers aren't even. Ah, it doesn't matter. What do you mean it doesn't matter? Right. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter. Honestly, you know, if you're the type of person who has to deal with somebody else does the cleaning and they frequently move your speakers around a bit, and that could be an advantage. I'll tell you what. If your boy Dave wants to send me a couple of these, right. I'll switch out my uh, my SVS Ultras. I don't really want the towers. I want to have a bookshelf of these. But, yes, I would love not having to worry about my wife. <laughs> right. Not that there's all that much cleaning going on in this room, to be honest with you. But <laughs> it does make a difference. All right. The announcement. This is also in the news. The announcement came next week, uh, just after we recorded, so we're a little bit last late. Week. To <laughs> last week. Last week. We got to next week, but it came yeah. last week, yes. A little bit late to the telly part, uh, to telly party. So what's telly if you haven't already heard, which I have not. Okay. Oh, this will be fun then. Yay. Telly is a 55-inch LCD TV. I know the sizes with a sound bar attached to the bottom. And below that sound bar is a second. Well, I have seen this. Sorry. Okay. I didn't know what it was called. It's a second wide short screen that shows ads all of the time. All in the time. Yes. In return for constant ads, you get the telly TV for $0 out of pocket. Yep. It's a completely ad-supported hardware lease. They say you can opt out of the literally constant ads, but if you do, they'll charge the credit card that you still have to supply on file for the full purchase price. They used to uh, list that as 500 but now they've removed the spec specific price from their site. There's a camera, a microphone, and a motion sensor all built into the front, and there are no built-in streaming services at all. Instead, the Tele TV comes bundled with an Android st uh, streaming stick, and it has three hdmi ports total tele tv is coming from the folks behind the pluto tv one of the free ad supported streaming tvs or fast options out there i didn't know that was a thing either that's an acronym but, they're using now free ad supported streaming tv that's uh, uh, you know pluto tv uh what is it free v from amazon that's one of those things yeah all right they're open by the fact that they that they're collecting all of your personal data and viewing habits, but they swear they don't do record anything, transmit any live camera or microphone feeds, or use facial 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 recognition. Honest, but yep. the hackers do, but not them. But <laughs> the hackers, scouts honor. 
They aim to ship 500,000 units this year and millions of units next year. That's what they aim to. Yes. <laughs> Whether or not they do is remains to be seen. <laughs> and when pre-orders opened up last week, they say over 100,000 people already signed up within the first 36 hours. Specs about the TV itself don't seem to be listed, but they say it's 4K and HDR and the soundbar has five drivers. They also list their own. Hey, Telly voice assistant that's right uh, we can say that one out loud because yes, i'll tell can. you right I'm not now worried about setting that off. <laughs> i'm not gonna be activating that thing <laughs> and some have games built in that use the motion sensor and the second screen at the bottom can also show widgets in addition to the constant ads for weather sports and streaming music so that's dumb <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, wow. I'm not saying that it, it's not the future of television. I'm not saying that. It's I'm the not. Black Mirror future of television. It is it's <laughs> definitely the Black Mirror future of television. Uh, so I have been on this podcast and for years, one who has downplayed the importance or the, the concerns about data privacy mm-hmm. uh, simply because I am boring. And I think that I am boring and I think that no one cares about me. And I sometimes appreciate targeted ads like this, the status stuff that I've been seeing nonstop. It's annoying. I'm going to, I'm not going to lie. It's annoying. It's also weird. And I, I've had discussions with people recently who are like, I was talking about something and then suddenly I started seeing ads for it. I think my phone's listening to me. <laughs> well, that definitely could be the case or it could just be like the first time you learn a new word within 24 hours, you hear somebody using that word. Or it could be that the yeah. reason you were talking about it is because you looked it up or saw it online. And right. you like, people or, always talk about it. I talked about yeah. it with my parents. They've never talked about it before. But did you bring your phone to your parents' place and you've connected to their Wi-Fi? Because all of your tracking data is now on their Wi-Fi network, which means it ends up on their devices that are connected yeah. to the same Wi-Fi network. So it's not magic or necessarily actually listening in on you it's more right. likely you have some cookies on a device that you brought and connected to a new wi-fi network so you know so i really you know i i really am i i, I downplay at least in my own life and in, in, in my own thought process how intrusive this stuff is or how mm-hmm. important it is there's a lot of people out there who are like the, gov- the government's never going to track me i'm like the government doesn't want to you are <laughs> right. a boring person who is doing nothing like you do nothing like my parents are worried about it i'm like you people go to three places you go to church you go to, you go to target and you go to Publix. those are the three places you go They're you don't go predictable. anywhere else like no one's tracking you because they don't have to they sure. just have to look on the calendar and they'll know where you at in the time of day and they'll know where you are because you have a regular schedule uh so but this this is dumb this is like <laughs> <laughs> this is way beyond. This like like you said, Black Mirror. This is way beyond. You know, you know, signing up or you know, clicking on uh, Chrome and having it remember that you were looking up. Uh, like every well, time just... I, I go, I go shopping for cycling clothes. I get nothing but cycling clothes ads on Facebook for a month. Right. You know, which I don't mind. Because it was just I like weird. Like I feel like a like a cultural shift happening because I'm I'm old enough that I'm of the generation where we hated ads. We yes. hated ads on TV. We yes. hated ads in magazines. We yes. hated ads being everywhere. We didn't like ads being thrust upon us all over the place. Yeah, yeah. We put up with them because what were you honestly going to do? But we hated ads. And now there's like there seems to be an actual cultural shift towards like, yeah, just bring on all the ads. We're just we're we're OK with it. I mean, I guess it's because nobody can get an actual stable job. And the only way you can make a living is by being an Instagram star. So bring on the ads. Cause that's literally the only way anybody young yeah. can make any money. So, Hey, if I can get a free TV and there's just going to be an ad on this secondary screen, that's going to be there all the time. I enjoyed the way the verge talked about it because they're like, you know, somebody's going to hack this TV and I'm not for the like, yeah. getting into the camera and listening to people they're gonna hack that second screen to do something telly doesn't want that second screen yeah. to do it's not gonna be that it, it's running android okay one of the most hackable os's <laughs> there has ever been that that second screen well, is gonna get used for things telly doesn't want. i mean it, it's it's like oh it's 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 easier to hack it's not so much easier to hack it's just that it's so everywhere that sure. it, it it's you get the most bang out of your hacking dollar but I mean, so, you know, you, you never know. Maybe maybe people who are, you know, more tech savvy than I am, they'll they'll get this thing and love it because they're going to be able to use that second screen for something Telly never intended. Yeah. And they're going to be like, hey, I, not only did I get this thing for free, I, I have this second screen I can use for this thing now. So right. maybe there's some upside to it. 
So speaking of lots of ads, YouTube yeah. announced to the advertisers at their Brandcast event that they will increase the unskippable, unskippable ad time limit to 30 seconds to 15 seconds, at least on built-in TV apps. And they'll also start showing ads when you pause a YouTube video. They're also experimenting with a, with cracking down on ad blockers in web browsers. Um, yeah, I watch a lot of YouTube. I'm mm-hmm. going to be honest with you. YouTube helps me sleep. That's how okay. I fall asleep a lot. Except so when the ads come in 10 times well, louder than whatever you're watching. Uh, I have it so low, it doesn't really matter. Anyways. Okay. So, but uh, yes, and there are... You know, like us, we we don't have really ads, do we? Do we? We have, have the minimum you're allowed to have ads and still yeah. have a branded channel. So. Yes. So we we are. I, I, most of the channels I watch are like that, but a lot. You know, I've noticed that ad, the ad frequency and yes. durations have increased significantly yes. very recently. So oh, yeah. I am not surprised by this at all. Yeah, just what we all wanted from our YouTube experience: uh, longer ads, unskippable ads, more ads, ads when you pause again. People seem to be like there. There seem to be people like actually cheering about this, which seems weird to me. Feels weird to me as an old millennial or like just a slightly too young to be a Gen Xer is where I fall. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Smack I don't dab like in the it. middle of Gen X, baby. I know. <laughs> I have you all have the trauma that well defined to, to, to show it. <laughs> show for it. <laughs> All right. Uh, we mentioned last week that Disney Plus and Hulu will be merging to a single app in the U.S., and along with that merger, some content will be removed from the services. Well, we've hinted at this. Yes. It turns out quite a bit more content than we might have expected is being removed, and some surprising titles are being removed with absolutely no indication that they'll be made available in any other way since most were streaming exclusives. Yeah. May 26th, so if you're listening to this and you're like, well, maybe I'll give that Willow a try. Right, Too yeah. late! <laughs> I mean, it might. You, by the time you're hearing this, it might literally be today is when it's going away. <laughs> May 26th is when they'll disappear, and over 50 shows and movies are going away. Although the complete list of titles is still being finalized, a selection <laughs> of notable titles includes Willow, the new series that just launched last November, The World, Ac- World According to Jeff Goldblum, which was heavily promoted when Disney Plus first launched, Marvel's Project Hero, and Marvel's M Power. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know. That was like that a one very is. new series focusing on all the uh, female characters and women creators behind the scenes, and like yep, uh, that's gone. <laughs> the Princess, Why the Last Man, Dollface, and many more. Why the Last Man? I wanted to see. I and know. I actually think I started watching Dollface. Uh, right. Remember. And the Princess, you watched that, and I remember you enjoying that. So that's kind of weird. That was the. Joey I don't King. remember the Princess. Which one was that? It was the R-rated one? Joey King starring in it. Yeah. No, whatever. I remember you talking about it. I, I remember you enjoying it. it. <laughs> supposedly yeah, I must have loved it uh, right, supposedly yeah. removing these titles and literally making them completely unavailable just like what David Zaslav did with at Warner Brothers Discovery will save Disney a bunch of money on residuals and tax breaks that's what they say residuals that's that really stings <laughs> That stings. And I for mean, me, that stings. That, people that are like, just... you know, when when is Netflix going to do this? But as far as I'm aware, and I might be wrong about this, maybe somebody with better insider information than I have will be able to correct me. But as far as I remember, I remember them talking about how, um, like they were pointing out how Netflix was paying seemingly more money for their exclusive series and TVs, the Netflix exclusives, that right. they were seemingly paying more money than made sense. But I recall at the time that their contracts were saying, no, we pay you once up front and that's it. There are no right. residuals yeah. on Netflix exclusives, meaning we can keep easy. this on our service and continue to show it forever and it isn't <coughs> going to cost us in perpetuity to continue paying the creators. And I think maybe... Whether intentionally or by happy accident, they foresaw some of this because their intention was, okay, if it's a Netflix exclusive, it's on our service forever and ever and ever. Uh, And other than the minimal cost of having it stored in the servers and whatever electricity it costs to stream it out to people, we aren't going to be dealing with uh, residuals and things like that, which is why they paid more upfront right away uh, to the creators. So uh, if that's what it takes to not have stuff that is literally not available any other way uh, remain on the service. I mean, I remember when Disney Plus first launched, that was still Bob Iger back then when, when the service first launched, and they like promised 
that anything that's on Disney Plus is not going to be taken away, that they aren't going to use the Disney Vault thing and have stuff only available for a limited time on the streaming service and then take it away and maybe bring it back. Like, they said that's the way Disney Plus was going to be. If it's here, it's here, and it's here to stay. And now they're like, nope, we can make more money if we take it away. So, yeah, fun times. Thanks for that That's unfortunate. I, I, like I said uh, about Willow, I, I do wish more. I, I think it has the potential to be one of those things Maybe. that, like, gets more popular over time as people are talking mm. about it because it's certainly like the first episode i kind of I, I was really kind of excited about and then like, the next two or three episodes i was like this sucks and then it picked back up again <laughs> so at least for me I, I started becoming uh more enchanted by the the the, <laughs> the, the characters and the terribleness of it so i i do think well that if that, you hear it in time binge it like crazy because it's gone yeah, yeah. do good it now uh, comments. Uh, Travis wanted to, this is from our listeners. Travis wanted to sh- uh, share a couple of updates. He had the Denon X2200W receiver that was buzzing after doing some power dusting. He was never able to fix it. So he found a good deal on a 2700H and he's very happy with it. Can't say there's any noticeable difference in the sound after running Odyssey, but this receiver doesn't buzz. So there's, yes, there, there's a th- there's that a is noticeable. He also upgraded his desktop speaker to so some Revel M16s paired up with the SVS PB12 NSD sub and powered by an old Denon X2000 receiver. He also added a 3-inch thick acoustic panel to his front wall, and that all sounds great. And that acoustic panel is almost invisible. I missed it the first time. It is white. It's white. <laughs> it is Everything white. else is white. So, yeah, you don't really notice the panel back there. So people who are wondering about the, yeah, can you have a panel that's uh, virtually invisible? Yes, you can. All right, this. Speakers are nice looking too. Mm-hmm. Honest with you. Coaxial. Is that coaxial? No, it's just a big old nope. waveguide. Big waveguide. All right. Let's get to the questions here. Mark. Mark wanted to help a friend uh, out with uh, some advice. His This friend had an apartment fire a little while ago and lost his 2.1 stereo system. Mm-hmm. He decided to replace it with the 5.1.4 Atmos setup after repairs. Well, uh- Without consulting Mark, his friend just went to Magnolia at Best Buy and came home with Eclipse Reference Series speaker package 5.1.4, including upward firing Atmos modules and the Arkham AVR5. What? That's the model number. Arkham is the brand. I know, uh, I know. Model I know. number is AVR5. I know. He said the salesperson at Best Buy told him that Arkham had a bigger power supply than the other brands and convinced him it was worth it. So, whatever. <laughs> his apartment is open concept so is a large space the theater area is a 10 by 10 you do not need 5.4 1.4 in here but yeah it's not that that's not it's not, it's not the end of the world like no. you can make it fit right. you can yeah. make it fit uh theater area is 10 by 10 feet and he doesn't listen very loud due to neighbors also the ceiling is a bit low at seven feet throughout the, the arkham offers drac for room correction but you have to buy a drac license as well as your own microphone and this yep. friend has zero interest in doing that or using any of the other room correction whatsoever because yeah. why would you? <laughs> I mean, it was coming from a stereo setup, so there's a little bit of that hanging around. So considering the situation in this friend's listening habits, Marx feels like he's got he got taken for a bit of a ride with the Arkham model, and Mark suggested to him that he probably only needed something like the Denon S760H that would limit him to 5.1.2 instead of 5.1.4. But he could use a, the over $1,000 in savings to get some room treatments instead. <laughs> Do we agree with Mark's advice? Is there any truth to the claim that Arkham's power supply is bigger and better? Any reason that this friend should really keep that Arkham AVR5? And which receiver would we get a recommend for him? I cannot stress this enough, Mark. First of all, you're wrong. You're 100% wrong. And the reason why uh. you're 100% wrong is because your friend doesn't want to hear your stupid <laughs> advice because you're stupid. You're stupid. <laughs> you're stupid because you do not wear a Best Buy polo, and yeah. that, and and if if you're right, then he got taken for a ride and spent a bunch of money he shouldn't have spent, and is uh, doesn't know what he's doing, and he's stupid. So you're basically looking at him in the <laughs> eye and telling him he's stupid, and he doesn't want to hear it, and he's not your friend anymore. And I so, will say um, the Arkham yeah. receiver is a very nice receiver. So yeah. it's not it's not as though. You're using it, and it's a piece of junk, and that's no. why it should be... Re- it's nothing like that. It's a very nice receiver, so if he keeps it, he's not, like, harming the audio quality of his system or anything like that. Uh, as far as does it have a bigger, better power supply than other brands, the AVR5, no. It, it does not. It just flatly does not. It's regular class AB amplifiers. It's 80 watts per channel, two channels driven. 
So that's the same they ratings. You, they could tell you hamsters are in there. That you're not you're not going to open it up and find out. It's, I it's mean, let's be honest. Same rating specification as any of the other big brands. There's nothing particularly special about the power supply or amplifiers in the AVR5. Where the salesperson might have been getting some of that information is Arkham's flagship does use a class G power supply, which is a little bit unusual. Uh, switch mode power supply uh, attached to class AB uh, amplifier output stages that is more efficient. There is more wattage coming out of that design than many of your typical just regular class AB designs. Having that class G or class H type of design does allow uh, the power supply to be more efficient and deliver more wattage through the output. So they probably got uh, you know, some marketing training from an Arcam yeah. uh, uh, representative at some point and pointed out this class G, which is a little bit unusual. You don't see that in a lot of other mass market AV receivers. And they probably took that to mean that all Arcam models have that, which they do not. It's only the flagship that has that. And the AVR5 definitely doesn't have anything particularly special on that front. Um, so, yeah, I mean... It, it just questions as wrote, uh, you know, uh, that's that's the one part of it. Do we agree that if you had, say, an extra thousand dollars on hand, we would rather spend that on acoustic treatments than a more expensive receiver? I agree with that. I don't yeah, know course. how that's amenable your friend is going to be to that. Also, this is an open concept space. So how well is he going to be able to acoustically treat that space it's not as though you can just say well this is the theater area so i'm just going to treat the side walls here and that's all going to work because the sound isn't going to uh you know let itself go to where i don't want it to go no it will the, the air will move wherever the air can move but uh yes in general if if he's able to put some acoustic treatments particularly if he's sitting close to his back wall having some acoustic treatments directly behind his head uh beyond the back wall behind him that would be ad advantageous uh very often for people where it's you know a less than optimal setup having some treatments on the front walls directly behind your left center and right speakers can help with that speaker boundary interference uh that we get off of the uh the close boundary behind the speakers so those are two likely candidates that that could make a nice difference if he has that extra budget on hand um would i tell somebody who specifically wanted to get to a 5.1.4 system that they ought to pair that back to 5.1.2 if they wanted it i i wouldn't personally say oh no you know bring it yeah. back down go to 5.1.2 instead save all this money i would have pointed him to an onkyo nr7100 uh those are on sale for 900 dollars right now most places i didn't notice best buy having it on sale but amazon and crutchfield both have it on sale for 900 dollars right now as we're recording this anyway and best buy definitely does price matching and you know if a retailer like crutchfield is offering it they will price match that for sure uh so you could get uh the the tx nr7100 from onkyo for 900 dollars right now um still a good price savings not as much as going all the way down to the denon s760 but still a good price savings over the arcam some things I like about that NR7100, uh, I mean, first and foremost, it actually has nine amplifiers built in. One of the tricky things here is that RCAM AVR5, it can process up to 11 speakers, but it only has seven amplifiers built in. So I don't know if he was even running 5.1.4. He would have needed to attach some other two-channel amplifier to <laughs> that system to even get to all nine speakers being powered. So that wasn't great advice from Best Buy. Yes, it can process 11, uh, but it only can power seven on its own. So the NR7100 can power all nine on its own. Uh, one of the things people will point out, if they wanted the ability to attach external amplifiers, you can't to the 7100. The Onkyo 7100 <laughs> does not have a full set of pre-outs. You would have to use the nine built-in amps, and it stops at nine. It cannot be expanded to 11. You cannot attach external amplifiers to it. But he got Klipsch reference speakers. And the listening area is 10 by 10. So he is not sitting far from these yep. Klipsch reference speakers. You do not need external amplifier power. The NR7100 has a really nice power supply in it. It can definitely power all nine of those Klipsch speakers. So that's where I would have pointed you. Full slew of HDMI 2.1 inputs and outputs if you want that. And one other thing I like, if he doesn't really want to use room correction... One thing where I am okay with Onkyo's AccuEQ is just setting your distances and levels. Sure. It does that perfectly fine, and it's very simple. So maybe he would be amenable to that. If he then wants to try Dirac, 
The Onkyo has Direct built in. It is not a separate license that you have to purchase additionally. It's already got it, and you don't have to buy a new microphone for it. You can use the microphone that comes with it. You just have to use the Direct smartphone app if you do that. But I'm like, all of that is like easier to ease someone into if he ever wants to try it. And then if he does want to get the desktop software and an external USB microphone, he can do that too without having to pay for a separate Direct license. So I'm like... To me, that NR7100 nicely checks all the boxes in this scenario. That's where I would have pointed to him. Uh, so yeah, there you go. That's my advice. Like Tom, I agree. I don't really think that most people who did all this purchasing on their own honestly want to hear it from a friend. But if it comes up, that would have been my advice. So the t things I'm going to say to you, because this goes along the same as what I started with and what Rob uh, has continued, is... Uh, First of all, he's going from a 2.1 system or a 2.0 system mm -hmm. to whatever this monstrosity is that he's just bought. It's 5.1.2 right now because he doesn't have external amplification. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> to the best that we are of our knowledge. Yeah. Um, and you be, you may there's a lot of tr there's a lot of true things that you can say. Okay. What you said was not untrue. I don't necessarily agree that if somebody's going to is already ready to go to 5.1.4 that you should try to talk them down to 5.1.2, which is what mm -hmm. Rob said. Uh, you could make some true statements like, you know, wouldn't it be nicer if you didn't, if your up forward firing modules were like not connected to your speaker so you could put them in better places if it turns out that where you currently have them is not the best place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that might be, you know, because I mean, in the open concept room, installing in ceiling speakers or speakers on the ceiling probably is a non-starter anyways you could say stuff like that you could say you know maybe clips are fine for this this room but you know, maybe get a better subwoofer you could, could have done that it's also not true. that the clip subs are bad i don't have a big beef going with no. a clip sub that that's, but if that's he's gonna try to fill this choice. space which he isn't because mm -hmm. he's not really listening at loud volume anyways yeah. the fact of the matter is is it, even if he just keeps what he's got everything he's got it is going to sound better because it's going to sound different. It's going to be, he's going from it's going to be two point yeah. to five point. And mm -hmm. that's going to be a massive improvement in at least the fact that you, he has surround sound, which is something that he didn't have before. Mm -hmm. He's made too many changes to mm -hmm. attribute anything to any one change. <laughs> like he will not be able to say he likes Atmos because he has no idea if he's enjoying the Atmos or the surround or anything else. Cause he's not had experience with one or the other uh, by themselves. So it's all going to be kind of, you know, an, amalg an amalgamation. So yes, you can make small, uh, in this case, if, you, if this person were talking to me, I would nod my head a lot and just right. say, Oh, that sounds great. Uh, okay. Well, bigger power supply. I don't know. Yeah, but maybe I suppose it could be could be possible. Uh, can you be surprised how many times I have conversations with people who genuinely know who I am? And I, that sounds <laughs> like I'm whatever, but they know that I know a lot about audio, and they still come at me with essentially wanting me to verify, <laughs> wanting me to verify yeah. that what they purchased was the right thing, and not wanting to listen to any anything that might suggest otherwise mm -hmm. so this is a very common thing and uh it's you really have to start from i agree everything that you bought was great it's fantastic and i mean i don't have any problem with the products themselves so yes. that, that that's why i'm fine leaving it alone if we want to leave it alone with what he has i don't have any problem with that so he says, since this is going to be a setup for with five floor level speakers and upward firing Atmos modules on for the overhead sounds, are four Atmos speakers even necessary? Would the, the experience honestly sound any different with just a 5.1.2 configuration? You have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea and neither do I because I'm not in that room and I won't mm. know how things work until they actually are there. It depends so much on how things are set up with Atmos, upward firing Atmos yeah. modules. I've yeah. talked about it. I'll and link I mean, up I, the... I am convinced that the Atmos modules are just going to go directly on top of wherever the front, left, right, and surround speakers go because, I mean, that is the way everything is described. That's the way it's described in the manual for those yes. speakers is put yes. them on top of your front, left, and right speakers and your surrounds. I mean, what I will say, Tom's going to have the link to the often used AV Gadgets article about how to really properly set up yeah. Atmos upper firing modules, which is great. You should follow that if you can convince your friend to read that much. It might help them out there. And what I will say is if you do have everything set up optimally, 
I do still prefer to have four Atmos speakers, even if they're upward firing speakers, because to get any sense of forward to back movement, yeah. you can't do that with just a pair. You yeah. can't do that with just 5.1.2. So, I mean, given that he's already purchased it, given that it's what he wanted, given that if yeah. he were to return the RCAM and go with the receiver that I'm recommending, you can do it and at a lower price than he paid. So there's not like a huge amount of drawbacks to me for sticking with the four. And if it is optimally set up, there is an advantage to it. Sometimes you do have front to back movement. There's a difference between what was overhead and in front of you versus what was overhead and behind you. And I like to be able to recreate that whenever yeah. possible. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, it. It's, it's not going to make a difference one way or the other as sure. far as what you recommend at this point. Well, like if, if this was somebody doing their Atmos setup for the first time and they're like, I don't really want to spend any more money than it takes to get to 5.1.2. Could I stop there? I would also say yes. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, you can absolutely stop there if the money's a problem. But this is the opposite direction. We're actually spending less and getting more. So, right. yeah. Since there was a problem getting the AV receiver connected to his Wi-Fi network, Mark's friend uses an Aero, Eero router. Eero, yeah. But it's not a mesh network, which is what Eero is best known for. It's just a single <laughs> router unit. This man does not like to expand beyond the basic functionality of anything <laughs> he's got. Like room correction? Nah, I don't need that. <laughs> I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna have it. I do mean, the that one I can kind of see not wanting to have to pay more for a separate mic and a Dirac license. That I didn't agree come with that, but that I, I don't want, get. Yeah, I understand that as well. He's just why you go with <laughs> Odyssey. Uh, customer support said the router seems to be the source of the problem. Turning off the frequency band, hopping, and firewall, and even manually changing the network name did not help. The only way he found to get the, it, a working a, a internet connection to the AV receiver was to activate the router's guest network and connect the AV receiver to that. Any ideas what's going on with all of that? Hardwire, my friend. Hardwire. I hate to say it. There is that. Uh, I mean, that, uh, <laughs> although I mean, in open concept, that could be a problematic trying to string yeah. an Ethernet wire wherever the router is in relation to the AV receiver. Yeah. Um, my guess here, uh, because the Eero router, that is definitely something that was purchased separately. So that means he got sure. something from his ISP, from his internet service provider. He got at least a modem. Uh, but most, as far as I can tell, you know, modems that come from your internet service provider, whoever that might be, uh, usually it's a combo uh, modem slash router. It's its own Wi-Fi router built in. He's just choosing to use uh, a Wi-Fi router that he purchases himself. So what often happens there is you get what's called a double NAT uh uh, double, what is that? Uh, network access transformer. I think that's what NAT stands for, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, basically, all it is is that, yeah, the idea is that the Wi Fi network within your house, that all has to be condensed down to a single IP address that goes out to the internet at large. That's the function that your router is performing in your house, is taking all of these different devices in your house and transforming them, translating them all down to a single uh, internet protocol address. So when you have two devices that are capable of that, um, one of them says, okay, your first one, the Euro router that you're connecting to directly, goes, okay, I translated that down to an IP address, but then that goes into the piece of hardware, the modem that your internet service provider gave to you, and it tries to do it again. Yes. And you sometimes get uh, uh, conflicts from that. So they call that a double NAT. I've linked to an article that explains it nicely and the fixes you can try uh, to, to get around that. Most of which involves having access to whatever hardware your ISP <laughs> gave right. to you and turning that off in that I had unit, to do that which with mine. isn't yeah. always possible. There are yeah. some hardware that you get from your internet service provider that don't let you do that. Uh, so, or at least not easily. <sighs> You can often, like what I did with, cause, so I was having modem problems or yeah. whatever. And my last modem, I went in and I, because it was, I, I looked up the model number, probably came across an article similar to the one that Rob has linked up, looked up the model number, found out what I needed to do, followed the instructions, which by the way, print them out or put them on a device because <laughs> once you start this process, you will not have internet access anymore. Right. Uh, it basically hacked into the to the modem router combination, turned off the router side of it and just made it a, a dumb modem. And then, so my, that thing started going on me and, and the internet provider said, hey, you know, you pr you're, you're due for a hardware upgrade, but just bring it in yeah. and we'll give you another one. And when I brought it in, I told them, I just want a modem. Yeah. I don't need the rest of it. I just yeah. need the modem. And they were like, oh, okay, yeah. And then they just, Guy gave me a modem, okay. which, which, which yeah. I think is becoming more and more common as yeah. people are investing in things like mesh oh, yeah. networks people buy, and stuff you like know, that. Yeah, mesh networks and, and so higher-end uh, routers, yeah. He could definitely call his uh, yeah. internet provider and say, hey, you know, 
this is the problem I'm having. It's, you know, I think it's It's this. usually that in these scenarios. Yeah. And I got it wrong. It was network address translation. That's what NAT stands for. So yeah. I was kind of close. JD. JD and his wife are thinking they'd like to use their garage, which pretty much just serves as storage area right now as a home theater. It's roughly 19 by 22 by 8. The main thing they want is a larger space with two rows of seats for when they have company over. At the moment, the wall... Oh, my Lord. There's a lot of stuff in here. Sorry. Yeah. If you're not looking at the Flickr <laughs> album or on the YouTube, then there's a lot of stuff. I mean, in there's here. still places to walk, so it's better than my storage area. Oh, I was going to say. <laughs> we park in our garage. We have ah, right. a two-car garage, technically. Like you could get two small cars in there. <laughs> my, my wife. And this, park, this my too, wife what he's showing there. looks like a two car garage yeah. side by side. Yeah. Uh, but yes, when the car's in there, we have about this amount of space to walk around. But <laughs> we'll see. Uh, at the moment, the walls and ceiling are taped and mudded drywall without any primer or paint. And the floor is bare cement at the back of the garage in the rear right corner. If you consider the garage to, door to be the front. Or the furnace water here and water soften. I take up about three feet by five feet. Okay, let me look at this. Uh, it's in mm-hmm. the corner there. See it? Yes. Yep. Three feet by five foot square, in square or whatever. Rectangle. More or less, yeah. JD and his wife are willing to take their time and spend upwards of $15,000 on renovating the garage. And he already has all the home theater equipment on hand. A Ben QTH. 685 projector with a 100-inch roll-down screen, a Denon 6700H receiver with the desire to use all 13 speaker channels purely for the cool factor. That's right. Yamo speakers for the floor level, uh, old satellite speakers for the overheads, and SVSP SB1000 Pro subwoofer, and a couple of sofas. I don't know if that sub's going to be big enough in here. Man. Indeed, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that might yeah, be one thing that could use an upgrade. A couple of bigger subs, but... Yeah. Just I also, I'm also looking at that screen going, what? Okay. Uh, despite the area, the idea and the budget behind all this, it seems as though JD and his wife still want to be able to easily turn the garage back into a car garage. If needed. Well, that's not going to be easy. He, I mean, from what he was <laughs> describing, that's what it sounded like, yeah. He's mentioning that they were thinking of putting Swiss tracks, interlocking garage tiles over the expo- exposed cement floor and putting rugs over that. And they're thinking they'll put up curtains rather than fully finishing the walls and hoping that might allow them to still have shelving for typical garage style storage that would be hidden but still accessible behind the curtains you have lost your mind <laughs> you have lost it you have lost your mind and he'd like to know if this planned acoustic treatments behind the curtains would also be okay any advice uh, about this would be appreciated so let's have at it okay you are forgetting that physics and geometry are a thing so mm. look at your current space that you have in here and pretend that you just took, you know, basically left everything on the sides as is, covered okay. it with curtains. Yeah. Would you still really have two space for two rows of seats? I mean, he's already uh, got a couple of couches in there. I don't yeah. know if the ones he's going to use are wider. And I mean, it's not it's not that you couldn't. You uh, it's just going to make. And now, now you want to shove 13 speakers in here and everything yes. else. I just, uh, I'm just, and then you're, you haven't really addressed the garage door at all right so yeah, i'm that, not sure what the plan is for the garage door well i i think the cl- plan for the garage door is very clear they're going to just leave it as is because they want to be right. able to just take everything out of here and then the garage becomes a garage again it seems like i mean otherwise you wouldn't do the swiss track system which is yeah. meant for garages that's what yeah. it's for i mean if you're trying to picture what it is it's uh basically just vinyl just or mats. metal yeah, or yeah. rubber tiles that ha- actually have um they're they're like slatted so that if there's moisture it can get down to the drains that will be in the in the garage floor so I mean, it really is meant for storage areas and garages. Um, so that wouldn't be your choice if you were like, you know, if the idea was completely convert the garage into living space. That's not what you would choose for that. Um, so, I mean, I have a much, much bigger con- concern than, than any worries about how you're going to finish things, what the floor finishing, what the wall finishing or any of that is going to be, what gear is going to go in here. Immaterial. I'm worried about, okay, you want to turn this into a pseudo living space a garage into a pseudo living space there are big concerns with doing that uh one of the things by code a garage you have to have you know external grade doors with seals between the garage and the house because the assumption is that you would have a car in here you might start that car in here yeah you might do so with the garage door closed, which you're not supposed to do, but you might. And we cannot have the off gases from the car, the exhaust from the car, with finding any path into the house. We cannot have that. 
normally when you have a setup like this where your hot water heater and your furnace have been positioned in the garage that is a more involved setup because you have to have direct air draw into the furnace from the outside of this building into the furnace you cannot have air return normal air return ducts that find their way back to your furnace when your furnace is in your garage because you cannot have any air from the garage getting into that furnace it has to be a sealed air system it looks like it is it's got all the pipes i would expect to see the even the water softener is like sealed to the ceiling and floor of this setup and that's all because you cannot have exhaust from a car that's expected to be in here getting into any part of that system they have to be completely airtight um so I have concerns about trying to turn this into a pseudo living space because this is not a climate controlled space. You don't have ventilation, right. let alone heating and air conditioning coming into this space. Uh, the the ventilation, heating and air conditioning is the garage door. <laughs> That's how air gets in and out of this space. And the temperature is not controlled. This is considered essentially external. It's like your attic. It's supposed to be the same temperature as whatever it is outside. Uh, so trying to use that as a theater for when company is over, I'm like, if you live in a place where the temperature year round is fairly stable then it's not necessarily going to be the end of the world temperature wise but I'm still concerned about ventilation uh, you're not going to be opening up that garage door to get you know cool air or uh, you know fresh air in here and it's completely sealed you don't have any forced air coming into this garage you don't have any air circulation you don't have any air circulation even under a gap in the door because by code it has to be a sealed door right. so this if your budget is going to be spent anywhere and it might exceed your fifteen thousand dollar budget in a hurry uh is if you are truly trying to turn this into a pseudo living space that is a big renovation that is a monster renovation yeah. that I don't think you had anything in mind uh, of that type of level. And I don't you think it's talk to a contractor, honestly, to yeah. for, for uh, just for turning this into a space that you can even AC, you know, yeah. to, to, cause it, you know, think of what temperature your garage is. And then that garage door in particular, I mean, what have you ever stood next to a garage door when, especially right. one of those that has all those, uh, like my garage door is bigger than yours and it is mm -hmm. um it is hurricane rated or whatever so yeah. it has these big long slats and it's it's a, it's it's a little bit more involved uh but even those have massive gaps underneath you know of course. in, in yeah. different places because who cares it's well, and it's also, no. that is your source of ventilation. It, yeah. is, it is the only source of fresh air. Everything else by code has to be very sealed. So yeah. I'm going to take this on two different tracks here. On the one track is... I've heard about people converting their garage into a dedicated home theater. How do they do that? Well, honestly, the way you do that is by constructing an entirely new room inside of the garage. Now you can have things like an air system that is outside of the new room you've constructed inside of the garage. It is not a cheap or easy or easily reversible it is the complete opposite of easily reversible process to do that but that is how people are genuinely converting a garage that they're not using for their car uh, for their cars into a dedicated home theater they're building a whole new room inside of that room and that way it's it's you treat it like any other newly constructed room it's just that instead of it being an addition on the outside of your house you you're building it inside of a pre-existing shell but that's all the garage is it's a shell it is not already living space so the other track is the people who go i've done this i've just taken my garage as is uh, I've thrown some fabric up on the wall so it doesn't look too ugly and I put my home theater gear, gear in there and I use it and it's fine and if it gets hot in the summer I don't go in there and if it gets cold in the winter I bring in a space heater and I'm only in there for two hours so I'm not worried about oxygen supply <laughs> and it's fine and I've done this and I'm like yeah you can do things that way you can set up a shop you know, in your garage that you don't park your car in and people do that all the time. Usually you want to leave the, leave the garage door open if you're doing that, but people do it all the time. They don't literally convert their garage into actual living space. They use their garage for other purposes all the time. It's just that the likelihood of you leaving your garage door open for theater time has got to be nil, I would assume. Right. That's not going to be the way. But like you say, if you're really only in there for a two-hour movie, you're not going to actually suffocate from too much CO2 and not enough oxygen. It will go through that garage door. You'll have some right. ventilation that way. 
And yeah, the temperature can be temporarily helped with a space heater or even just a, you know, a portable air conditioning unit if you can stand the noise. The other thing is the noise, right? right. You're not building in the furnace and the water heater and all that. You're not constructing walls around that. And if you did, there's a bunch of code that you got to be worried about if you do that possibly slightly easier in your scenario because it should already be completely air sealed in this scenario so maybe you don't have to worry about louvers and air circulation and thing like that with the surrounding space you might be able to just build that thing in by code but that's a whole thing you'd have to talk to a contractor to as well so i'm gonna take this on the assumption that you were thinking I'm not going to fully renovate this into living space. I'm not bringing in a contractor. I'm not redoing all my HVAC. I'm just going to take this space that exists and try and make it not look too ugly. I'm only going to be in there two hours at a time, and that's the track you're going to take. I have to say to cover our behinds on illegal grounds, don't do that. If you're turning this into pseudo living space, you're supposed to do everything by code and spend the tens of thousands of dollars it would take to do that. But if... You're just the person who's going to ignore that advice and do this. I don't have a big problem with, yeah, I'm covering the walls and maybe the ceiling with fabric instead of fully finishing and painting it. That's fine. If you put acoustic treatments behind those curtains, that's totally fine. Where that that not a problem for how the acoustic treatments act or for doing things that way. I agree with Tom. Be extra careful about space. If you're thinking you're gonna have a full set of shelves behind those curtains, it is gonna shrink the visible dimensions of your room. And you're gonna have to put up with noise in here. You're, you're yes. not gonna be able to mitigate the noise from the, the existing. The gonna activate that stuff. That that garage door like you would not believe <laughs> oh yes yeah like this isn't going to be an optimal theater but if there's nowhere else in your house that a theater could go but my real advice is is there anywhere else in your house that a theater could go because this is either going to be a pretty darn compromised setup yeah. that i don't have a problem with lots of people enjoy setups like that but i'm just letting you know set your expectations is all i'm trying to get at yeah. uh that this is either going to be a pretty darn compromised theater or it's going to be way more expensive than what you thought it was going to be to fully 15 grand this probably space. alone doesn't doesn't do the renovations that you would want to do to this room to make it a livable space oh god no I, God, I don't. No. I don't no even way. think that gets you. I don't even think it gets you a, a room that you can put stuff in. Oh, it's at least thirty five thousand plus. Yeah. So you are. <laughs> uh, you know, So th there's a lot going on here. Uh, Rob's yeah. right about the curtains. You can put uh, everything. Oh, yeah. Everything behind curtains. Acoustic treatments in particular. Don't give a crap about curtains. So that's fine. If you wanted to put all your speakers and stuff behind curtains, you can do that too. You just yep. have to get acoustically transparent cu curtains. Yep. So now that's just a slightly different. I mean, I don't even think it really adds that much money. I mean, especially if you make your nah. own curtains, sure. you know, if, if you're making your own, I don't think it's going to cost you any more. It's just going to be a little bit more time. And I, like, the I don't have any problem with the Swiss tracks on the floor, yeah. just so it's not bare cement. That makes sense. You can that get the vinyl ones too. that look like wood. Yeah. So that makes perfect sense. You can do that. Rugs down there is fine. So, I mean, I think I putting the pieces together, reading between the lines, what you had in mind, I have to say from a legal ground our advice has to be don't do it because you're not yes. really supposed to seal the door and go sit in your garage with a bunch of people and not have any ventilation. Uh, you're supposed to leave the garage door open if you do that. That has to be our legal advice. But reading between the lines what I think you want to do, yeah, I would actually aim to spend a lot less than ten to $15,000. I would, I would try to do this on the cheap because, yeah, it's either do it and don't spend very much money at all or go whole hog and be prepared to, prepared to spend probably $40,000, I would think. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, and I, <laughs> I think if I can just say one last thing about this before yeah. we go on. If your idea here is you're going to have a dedicated space that will be superior right sounding and looking because it's closed and in and it's a rectangle and it's dedicated and i it's think dedicated, that's the thing yeah. you think this if you're thinking that this dedicated space will be superior it i think it's i think you're going to be very disappointed by the results if you don't kind of go whole i am concerned this. yeah uh yeah. not only will it not be as comfortable as you think because it's either going to be too hot or too cold most of the time <laughs> but it's also not going to sound nearly as good as you want it to uh, with all the extra noise from everything that's going to be rattling in there, uh, you know, I, I think you either just say, Hey, we're going to convert this room full stop right? or we're going to just find another space, which in is our house. literally just think, what would it cost to put an addition this size onto the house? That's the price. That's you're how dealing much. With. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Joe. Joe is looking at some Sony projectors. Use Sony projectors, but there are, uh, but there are the forum rumblings out there about how Sony's SXRD panels can lose all, lose their native contrast over time due to degradation, leading to grayer black levels. What are our thoughts on this? Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is a known issue in the commercial projectors okay. uh, that went into full sized movie theaters uh, and are being driven by insanely powerful lasers um that yes just over time sheer heat uh degrades those uh they're liquid crystal on silicon but it degrades those panels uh over time are there people with home uh sony projectors using those similar technology uh liquid crystal on silicon they call it uh sony crystal reflective display the x standing for crystal uh sxrd panels uh who have had uh measurable degradation in the contrast of their panels and yes there are there are people who have run their projectors very long times with high lamp levels in not well ventilated spaces and they have heated up and those panels have degraded that is a true thing that is measurable and demonstrable and we cannot deny that it exists is it a problem for the majority of sony sxrd projector owners no it is not uh for the majority of home owners who use their projectors occasionally to watch a movie or two every week and they don't have it poorly ventilated and they aren't blasting it in the highest light output at all times this isn't a major concern so i wouldn't be overly worried about buying a used sony projector um but if it's got a gazillion hours on it then it is possible i can't deny that it's possible it was mostly the commercial ones. <laughs> All right. My son just got home from school because my... Okay, listen. Just go lie down. Violet? That he you wasn't saying to... that to his son. That you was don't weird. need to go, you don't need to go say hi to him. <laughs> I see. Why, why are you home? <laughs> what? The doggos are excited. Okay. All right. That's not the son home from school. That's the son home from work. Okay. Apparently. I don't know. Whatever. She's going to want to come back in here in like 10 minutes. She's going to go out there, lick his ankles twice, and then want to come back in. That's what dogs do. Michael. Michael and his wife repainted their living room. It used to be white. Now it's gray. Ooh, sad. It's a very (laughs) depressing thing. We all have gray rooms. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Uh, He has some prime elevation speakers mounted up high. He just had uh, some white speaker wire held in place with clips. That blended into the old white paint finish just fine. But now the walls are gray, and those white speaker wires contrast and stick out a bit. He knows uh, there are cable raceways, but he's tried those before. He would not like the results. Could he just paint the speaker wire directly to have it better blend into the wall color? Or maybe he could just tape over the speaker wires and then paint the tape. What do we suggest? I mean, you literally had the tape the paint going <laughs> you could have just mm-hmm. slapped some paint on top of them and see how it looked um i mean, I mean yeah is there if a, you don't like I the mean, raceways i don't see why you would like the, the <laughs> i know the painted, painted wire just wire. hanging there with a shadow behind and plus it. if that speaker wire ever does move the the paint on the jacket is going to crack instantly yeah. Yeah. uh it's not like the paint is going to magically become bendy and durable on the outside of a wire jacket so i'm not a huge fan of just painting the jacket of the wire directly i i think that's going to be a little less than sophisticated looking in a very quick amount of time um is there such a thing as taping over it and painting that? Yeah, you're sure. going to have a weird looking bump that I think would look worse than a cable raceway, if I'm being honest, uh, to do that. So my honest answer, uh, answer uh, first thought is uh, Sewell's ghost wire. Uh, this yeah. would be replacing the wire you have. But this is exceedingly flat, self-adhesive, paintable wire, which won't be moving and bending because you are adhering it to the wall. Uh, it is 16 gauge. That's the standard that they have. And then to convert it to regular speaker wire, because you can't plug this super flat wire directly into the binding posts of your speakers or AV receiver, uh, they have these little terminal blocks that go on either end. So that just you know easily converts the very, very flat wire. Uh, you just uh, uh, move it in there, clip it down. It attaches to the metal inside and converts it to something that regular speaker wire can plug into. So uh, yeah, super ghost wire um you can get that in 25 foot links or 50 foot links or 100 foot links uh it's basically just ever so slightly more than a buck a foot that's what they charge for the Sewell ghost wire and then the uh, terminal blocks you get uh, four of them so that's enough for two pairs of speakers one on either end of uh, two pairs of speakers that's uh, 19 dollars. so there that's the price for the Sewell ghost wire the only pro and I, I will link up an article about hiding speaker wire in an apartment the idea there being that you're not drilling holes in walls because you didn't say anything yeah. about drilling holes in walls. But really, 
unless you have a fire break in your wall, mm-hmm. it's really not that hard to run speaker yeah. wire from the floor yeah. to the ceiling. Yeah. You know, like if you get it over there, getting from the floor to the ceiling is not that big of a deal. You can, I mean, th- I, I know that this is your living room, right? Yeah. And uh, therefore, you know, you can't do my normal thing, which is to just turn the dang lights off. Yeah. Because that's what <laughs> my, I don't see anything because the lights are always off. But uh, just throwing a, uh, uh, the, 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 the speaker wire that Rob's talking about is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes it requires a little bit more work than you think to make it truly invisible. I mean, if you want it completely invisible, then you're mudding over it, which you can yes. do. You yes. can mud, it, mud over it and feather the mud and uh, have that all dry and do the sanding and everything and then yeah. paint over that. Uh, so you can do that if you're okay with like, yeah, on close inspection, I can see there's a little seam on this wall here. Then you can just do it there and then paint it directly. Yeah. Uh, but the, on close inspection, there'll be the little seam if you do it that way. So Michael looked up uh, the Sewell ghost wire after Rob suggested to him and found what seems to be a nearly identical product from a price at a lower price. Mono price at a lower price. Sounds like <laughs> mono price. Any reason to pay more for the Sewell version? Uh, uh, not that I could really tell. Yeah, right, they, they have very similar things. Uh, 25 feet for uh, just under $16. So that's less than a buck a foot. And then uh, $12 for the uh, the pack of four uh, terminal blocks. So a few dollars saving there. If you do buy directly from Monoprice, they do charge shipping on top of that. So maybe that ends up evening out the price pretty much yeah. to be... Uh, but yeah, there's not gigantic differences in price here. But yeah, if one's out of stock, go to the other. I wouldn't have any problem doing that. All right. Toke. Toke has an L-shaped room. The theater area portion is roughly 12 feet front to back and 23 feet wide. It's open to the kitchen, forming the L-shape. So the L, it's not really an L. It's a rectangle or square, and then the I mean, Yeah, yeah. the space. living area is a rectangle, and then it's open to the kitchen. So the, the total open area is an L-shape. It's not an enclosed rectangle uh, just see. for the theater. That's what we're getting at. Yeah. Okay. So he's got uh, four passive subwoofers on hand. They're all dual 10-inch driver units. So eight drivers total housed in four cabinets. They're very thin, sealed cabinets meant to be wall-mountable. They're from a brand called Art Acoustic, which I have heard of. It's been a lot okay. of years, but I have heard of them. Yes, I see them here. He's got them not mounted in the wall. <laughs> no, he's saying these are not the final positions, but just so, just so we can see what the heck these things are. Yeah. To power the four subs, he's got a stereo amplifier rated to deliver 450 watts into 8 ohms per channel. So he's wired two subwoofers in series to each amplifier channel, the subs being 4 ohm loads on their own. He would like to put one subwoofer in each corner of his theater area, hoping that will improve the uniformity of his low frequency output. His receiver is a NAD uh, T758 version 3. Which only has a single subwoofer pre out. It can process up to 7.1.4, but has seven amplifiers built in, and those built in amps cannot be reassigned. The four overhead channels must always be powered externally. Yeah. So he has an eight channel crown amp on hand, rated at 125 watts per channel to either eight or four ohms. Does not increase its wattage output to four ohms versus eight ohms. <laughs> let, me tell you something, let me tell you something about that eight ohm rating. <laughs> okay, so anyways. Uh, <laughs> and he owns a mini DSP 2 by 4 HD. He has zero intent to make any additional purchases. So what he, he would like to know, the very best way to connect everything and power his four subwoofers, he could plug the receiver subwoofer pre-out into his mini DSP, giving him independent settings for an EQ for all four subs, and then use four of the eight amplifier channels uh, of his crown amp, but that would only deliver 125 watts into each subwoofer. Or he could set up the mini DSP for only two subwoofer outputs and continue to use his 450 watt per channel stereo amp to power two pairs of subwoofers uh, wired in series, if he did that, should he wire the two front subs together and the two back subs together or something else? Or some other configuration, if we think of something entirely different, would be better. What do we say? Um, so, yeah, he's got four of these uh, dual wall, driver, dual driver, wall mounted, whatever, the yeah. wall in, in wall. Super subs. skinny subs. Yeah. yeah. So he's going to put two in one area and two in that. First of all, putting them across the room from each other and within the theater area is not how this works. <laughs> I, I mean, so, I mean, yeah, because I was going to say, like, first instinct, if this were a sealed rectangular room, oh, could we simplify this? Yes. Because we could just take a Y splitter from the single subwoofer output of your NAD AV receiver, uh, 
why split that into the two, the left and right inputs of your stereo amp that you're already using? It's a mono signal all the way down. The mini right. DSP doesn't factor into it whatsoever. And we could just drive all four of your subs with one mono output uh, with the four subs in the four corners of a sealed rectangular room. But this is an L-shaped room that does throw a bit of a wrench into that. If you have the four subs in the four corners of the theater area, they aren't in the four corners of a sealed rectangular room. It is open to the kitchen. Um, so I end up, you know, in, in the interest of wanting to be as honest as possible, having to walk back the simplest idea of just giving a single mono signal to all four of these subs. It would be kind of nice to have some adjustability. So... I can see pros and cons. Um, you know, my my instinct again here is, yeah, if you can drive all four of these subs independently and you already have a uh, mini DSP on hand that is up to this task and you don't have to purchase anything else, the multi-sub optimizer software is free and I would be uh, leaning towards using that. Uh, the, the size of the space that you have, it's not gigantic. Um... However, these subs are not massively high output yeah. or tremendously efficient. I would definitely and, stack them, basically. Have two and two. Ah. Uh, mm. I mean, now, that's it, an option I didn't even have in mind, but I think Tom might have hit on the, on the yeah. optimal way to do this. Yeah. yeah, rather than the four corners, Yeah, maybe we treat this as it's a dual, dual subwoofer, subwoofer setup, yeah. which you already know how to connect that. Yeah. <laughs> you're already doing it. We agree, wire them in series for the uh, stereo amplifier that you're using. That is optimal. But yeah, actually having basically, you know, two cabinets each uh, yeah. right beside each other or one right above the other. Either and, way, it uh, really and, and treating this as dual subs with four drivers per sub. That's what we're ultimately That's, getting at. Yeah. But in terms of what kind of output and extension these these very, very skinny subwoofers have, you kind of need to do that, even though you don't have a gigantic space, but that, that Tom's hit it, would be the, the optimal way, actually, to do this. So uh, do you need the mini DSP uh, for doing that? Well, it doesn't hurt anything, because it does still give you the ability to at least have independent distances and levels, which you can't right. get directly out of the NAD by itself, which only has the single subwoofer output. You could still try running the multi-sub optimizer software, but it doesn't work that great when you only have two uh, separate locations. But you know, basically, you already have everything on hand, uh, and this simplifies everything you're talking about. We aren't worried about not having enough amplifier power this way. We aren't so concerned yeah. about a complicated setup. We've actually simplified things for you, kept it basically the way you already have and it. And you're going to get like 6 dB more output. That's right. Per, yeah. per subwoofer location. Yeah, so, which is more important in this setup. I think so, because... With this gear. Yeah. With this gear and this this particular size room i think yeah. that if you stack these subs they, and these, or co-locate might... them i mean i say stacked but i mean co-locate yeah, yeah, yeah. and you gotta remember that the, the wavelengths of base are such that you know they have within like five feet of each other <laughs> so like <laughs> co-locate but i mean these subs you could quite readily put one right above the other yeah. or one right beside the other yeah. on your wall these could go on the two side walls right on yeah. the left wall on the right wall and they're not going to be a problem for floor space or blending in or right. anything like that because right. uh, that's exactly what they're meant to do is go right up against the walls and you could have a pretty darn good setup that way and yeah i so think i i don't hate it's it's other i don't <laughs> hate the other. idea <laughs> of using the multi-sub optimizer i do yeah, not hate yeah. that idea i think it would i think it it, it very if the if you had like three or for like subs that could fill this space by themselves, which sure. is what we want in in a subwoofer. Uh, you know, you want something that can pressurize the space. If we, you had that, I would say that is almost certainly the best way to go. Like, find mm. like I don't even care where they go. Just throw them in three different or four different, however many spots you, you, know, mm -hmm. for, you know for subs that you have. But I feel like output is going to be a little bit more key here and well and especially for down lower like like yeah. you just not like these have extension but they get quieter and quieter the lower that you go so having them co-located just gives you that extra bit of output down low uh, that i think is going to be more valuable here so i mean look if you have lots of time to experiment there isn't really any reason you couldn't try using Both. the multi-sub optimizer software yeah. with the four subs in the four corners. Go ahead and try that versus co-locating two pairs of subs and running things that way. If you've got lots of time to do it, uh, certainly run the experiment. But yeah, our recommendation would be other. <laughs> it would be co-locating, having you know two subwoofers, and we're fine still using the mini SP. Just, just have independent levels and distances set. 
Yeah, I don't really think there's any like all the rest of the stuff that Reddit talks about as far as that you need to need to do. Timing. Oh, that's a rabbit hole. That's a timing rabbit hole. and phase and all this other nonsense. Just, yeah. just don't worry about Pair it. Pair of subs. Pair of subs. Julian. Julius, Julian wrote to us a while back with his plans to expand his desktop setup to a full-blown Atmos near-field theater. That conversation got delayed. But he made a few changes based on our advice with good results so far. So now he's back with some more questions about his planned expansion to his setup. To start, this is a work setup as he's a computer programmer working from home. But he's semi-retired now, so that's why he'd like to expand this office setup in, uh, into his personal movie and games room. He's got three monitors side by side and used to have a pair of CAF LS50 speakers elevated and positioned above those monitors. He had them paired with a compact CAF subwoofer, one of the high-end dual opposed driver models, and powered by a NAD M33 stereo integrated amp. His office room is just under 10 feet wide and 8.5 feet deep with shelves on the back wall, but there's a permanent opening to the dining room in the rear right. His original intention was to replace the main screen uh, in the middle with an LG OLED, but still keep the other two screens on either side or possibly stacked both to one side, one above the other. And he had figured he'd need a center speaker or perhaps a speaker with a three-channel soundbar form factor. But we told him to try positioning his CAF LS50 speakers optimally at ear level, which he has done now. He also added an SVS uh, 3000 micro so that he can have dual subs. With the LS50s on either side of his main computer monitor, he's found that the stereo imaging is so good he no longer needs a center speaker. Because <laughs> this is a one-seat oh setup my for God. sure. <laughs> The most important speaker? You don't need the most important speaker? Have you not read the internet, sir? They would beg to differ with you. You need the most important speaker. The center is the most important. Listen to anybody other than me, and they will tell you that the center speaker is the most important. Have you lost your mind? What kind of audiophile are you? Mm. Like, what are you? Do you? Did you have to turn your card to say that? sarcasm people this is sarcasm very much so yes if if you have a center speaker we do want it to be a good one that that is important but uh yeah you can you can dispense with the physical center speaker particularly when this is one seat optimally positioned between two stereo speakers you will get a very good phantom center when those speakers are set up properly he's done that now and he's like yep don't need a center anymore because i've got one seat and i know where i sit that's right and while positioning of his two subwoofers might seem odd, he has fully calibrated using Room EQ Wizard and Drac Live, and all sounds great and much better than before. I don't know where his is one. He's hang, got one oh, like on a on stand a, <laughs> on a stand over to the left, one under his desk. It is weird, but I will absolutely take your word for it. Again, for a single seat, literally, you don't can care. absolutely make this work. Yeah, yes. I literally, don't care. Yeah. Uh, let's just say, oh, I scroll up too far. Well, no, what happened? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I scroll up too far. Oh, here we go. Nope, I scroll down too far. Well, let's, okay, wait. He's found that he doesn't need it. Okay, and uh, Rock Live also not much better. So now to his planned expansion to Atmos. All right, mm-hmm. we got a lot of pictures here that I had to scroll past. So okay. that's, a, that's a recent. I haven't worn that shirt. I wore that shirt last week and I haven't worn it in a long time. So <laughs> uh, that must be a very recent episode. It must be last week. It could week's. be. This is clearly a near field setup with the front speakers, uh, and the front speakers are necessarily up against this, the front wall. This CAF LS50 speakers have rear ports, so would it be better to swap them out for sealed speakers? Maybe the three way CAF R2 meta speakers, which he's seen some reviews for, claiming they're even better than LS50s. <laughs> have you ever made a purchase and then spent the next six months trying to convince yourself that it was worth it, only to decide that it really wasn't? Mm. If not, this is your chance. Okay. <laughs> there Go. is no world where I would replace your LS50s in this setup. They are fabulous speakers. Uh, for a near field setup, they're wonderful. More than you need. Excellent, excellent sounding. The port that they have on the back is no kind of problem in this setup that you've no. got uh, because you, you just aren't getting to the sort of output levels uh, where you're the least bit worried about any noise coming out of the port and you've got dual subwoofers that you already crossed those speakers over to so it's not as though they're playing way down into the base where the port might have any sort of influence i would say yep they're right up close to the wall maybe you have some acoustic treatment on that front wall that is directly behind those speakers that would be a worthwhile thing to add here but you do not need to change your speakers and i am 
Look, I love the Kef R3 speaker series. I haven't heard the new R3 metas. I don't know what or if they've changed anything in terms of the actual sound quality there. But like the LS50s to the R3 metas, that's not going to be any sort of discernible difference. I'm sorry. Yeah, like I just look without having heard them. I'm confident in saying that. I, I don't think there's any need for you to do this. Where the R3, R, uh, R, R2s, R3s, whatever it was, R series speakers have an advantage over the LS50s is they can play louder. They have the ability to play louder. You don't need that in this setup. You're sitting two and a half, three feet away. <laughs> There's just no reason you need your front speakers uh, to play louder than the LS50s can. Yeah. So keep what you got. No reason. I to cannot play. stress enough how little I think a dif sonic difference this is going to make. For yeah, you. yeah, yeah. It literally is the smallest possible infinitesimal i mean reviewers sonic. always overpraise being oh able to play God. louder and being able to play lower they love yes. the speaker that can play lower and by the specs the r2 speaker can do that so it's better or it's the better speaker you can play louder and lower look at the setup you have you don't need louder <laughs> you're crossing over to dual subs you don't need lower so yeah, don't so due to the limited amount of space he had in mind to use kef's super thin t101 speakers for all other positions Will they provide a good timbre match to his LS50s? Would they? Would they? Would the timbre match be better uh, with that? <laughs> Sorry, I have to delete this. They, uh, but, but be better with the R2 <laughs> metas, or is there a better choice for surrounds and overheads? <laughs> keeping in mind how little space he has available to work with. Um, again. You are so close to everything. I understand yeah. why you might want to use very, very thin speakers. We sure. have recommended the T101s before. We have. and For it, some scenarios, sure. Yeah, for, yeah. Ver for, for very specific scenarios of people who literally only want thin speakers and know nothing else. That is not mm -hmm. you. What you want mm -hmm. is something that's going to sound similar to the speakers mm -hmm. you currently have. And I know they both say Kef on it. They don't sound the same. Yeah. They yeah, no, the, the T series speakers that that would be a compromise on this one, and no, they wouldn't match particularly better with the LS fifties no. or the R twos. That, that they only that match isn't... themselves. I think yeah. I don't think they match anything else. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little hesitant. I gotta tell you to go with the uh, the T one hundred and one speakers here. So. My alternative is actually not even Kef. They used to have the wonderful E series, the Egg series. Uh, that, that was a wonderful match, but you can't get those anymore. Uh, so honestly, mono prices, uh, THX satellite speakers, which are basically six inch cubes, and uh, they do have a uh, keyhole mount on the back, so they're very easy uh, to mount that way, either directly to the wall or with mono prices own uh, mounts that go right into that keyhole mount on the back of it if you want to have some angling uh, uh, adjustability to them. But those ones, uh, you know, a similar uh, concentric driver design layout, very neutral response, um, not the most sensitive speakers. They're, they're small, but again, you're three feet away from any of these things. So I'm not worried about that. That is one that I think is reasonable. They're like $250 a pair. So they're not going to break the bank. Uh, size wise, they're appropriate. They're bigger than you might think just looking at them. They're not right. Bose cubes. These aren't two inch drivers. Yeah, they're four six and inch, a half inch drivers inch. in there. But yeah, yeah they're six, six inch, inch cubes. cubes. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, I, I agree. You basically want something flat, and yeah. uh, that's what these are. So yeah. again, you don't need a base extension. You really for surrounds and overheads, you don't even need all that much treble extension. <laughs> you just kind of need <laughs> you kind of need it not to sound different. And the T one yeah. ones, I think, would sound different. Yeah, uh, they're pretty compromised. And I mean, they'll they're flat, but they're also big. They're also you know they're not. They're surface wide. area big, surface yeah. area wide, yeah. big. I would go with these. I mean, you can make you could make you can make an argument for the prime elevations or the prime satellites or yeah, you, could. you know any number of other satellite style speakers that are yeah. flat sound or flat frequency response. But definitely you, the prime elevations are physically bigger than yes. the uh, monoprice satellites. Yeah, for sure. So the, and I, like I, he's I already got all black speakers. All the speakers he has are black. So yeah. those those monolith satellites would blend right in. They'd look like all the rest of your speakers. So he's quite set on getting a nine-channel Marantz receiver since he no longer needs a center speaker. Could he use that amplifier channel to power a single surround back speaker instead? No. No. He cannot do that. They don't let you configure it that way. He was thinking he could put a single surround back within the shelves on the back wall to make sure he hears any sounds that are directly behind him when he's gaming. He's going to be putting absorption panels into the back of that cabinet. Uh, yeah, it's not going to work. That's You'll be I fine. I would not do that. Just put two surround... Like, first of all, you yeah. won't need as much surface area... With, 
if you're not putting the T101s back there. So you'll have right. more placement options, really. Yeah. Uh, the depth will be a little bit different with the with the monoprice cube thingies, but um, you will have plenty of space it will sound like it's coming directly behind you Don't yeah just worry. to make sure your surrounds aren't like 90 degrees to your sides get them to the 110 degrees or 120 yeah. degrees uh so slightly behind you and it will absolutely in your single listening position sound like things are directly behind you when they're supposed to be directly behind you and you don't have the option to hook things up the way you wanted to anyway you cannot right. reassign the center uh, binding post on the AV receiver or the center pre-out to drive a single surround back speaker. That is not a configuration option. So it isn't even an option to begin with. And we really say you don't need to do that anyway. Yeah. I mean, you could cheat them so that they're a little bit more THX uh, that surround back speakers. THX used to recommend that that surround be Well, like he's not going to have surround backs. Oh, he's, he's just having he's, surrounds? He will just have surrounds. He was thinking like a seven channel setup where there's a single surround back rather than a center. Right. <laughs> what so no, you're seeing? not going to, Oh, these are heights that I'm seeing. Yeah. Here. He's got heights. Oh, up there, I yeah. see. Yeah. 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 No, you just need five point. Forget it. Yep. Uh, Kieran in India, Kieran recently found and watched some of our videos on YouTube that will only went up to 1080p resolution, but they were not our videos. Oh, some, videos. some videos, sorry, <laughs> yeah. 1080p resolution, but they were in HDR. He thought they looked pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, we have HDR. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just some videos on YouTube. <laughs> Max resolution 1080p, right. but they came with HDR. Obviously, the majority of available HDR content is found on 4K videos, but 4K isn't actually necessary for HDR, correct? That is correct. You do. They are separate things. They are individual things. But yeah, I mean, predominantly 4K came along. Doesn't really make as much of a difference from 1080p to 4K as the marketing wanted everyone to believe. So like, hey, we better throw something on there that's actually noticeable to the human eye. Yeah. So HDR came along for the ride. So why isn't full HD with HDR more of a thing? Why isn't it being explored more for streaming content? And could it actually be added to regular Blu-rays rather than having to use Ultra HD Blu-rays? What? Okay, Rob kind of answered that question already. Mm. It's all about sales and marketing. You, <laughs> you, you know, can we do this thing technologically? You know, mm. it's like why are why is why do we have to have HDMI when we have optical? Like HDMI <laughs> can be thrown through an optical cable. Why do I have to have an HDMI, HDMI connection on either side? Mm. Why can I have just something else? Uh, well, the Toslink that's currently I wrote an article about this. Uh, the Toslink. Uh, connector at the end of the optical cable it was never meant for all this bandwidth and everything else that's going through it but there's no reason why we couldn't have a different connector up there <laughs> there's no reason there's no reason right. why we couldn't have something that was less stupid than HDMI mm. except for the fact that everybody has bought into HDMI for the copy protection this is the <laughs> same thing here very similar in that everybody has bought into the fact that we want to sell 4k yeah. And therefore, we're going to package things with 4K that mm-hmm. people also want, uh, because the, and I'm I'm gonna I want people to understand that when I say this, I mean uneducated but certainly capable of understanding. Stupid people think 4K <laughs> is the important bit. Sure. Okay. Because 4K is more it's than 1080p. Number. Okay. 4K is more. Just mm-hmm. like people care about how many watts their receiver has. Anybody that does any sort of research at all quickly understands or is told multiple times on even Reddit, which is not the great source of information many times, that the wattage numbers on receivers are meaningless. They are. (laughs) They are meaningless for the most part. Pretty close. So 4K is very similar and 8K and 16K. I just had somebody ask me the other day about like, why is 4K important? I'm like, it's not. It's not. Like, when was the last time? First of all, how big is your TV? It's 55 inches. See? It's not. Right, yeah. You never, ha- you and never saw a 10 pixel. Ten feet away. <laughs> you never saw a pixel. So you're yeah. still never going to see a pixel. So why is 4K important? Because of all the other stuff they package with it, and yeah. HDR is one of them. Could they put HDR with 480i? Probably. Yep. I don't see any reason why they couldn't do it because it's a separate thing. Are they ever going to yep. do that? No. Why would they? Not likely. I mean, (laughs) there are 1080p HDR content. Uh, You know, a lot of what's on broadcast TV coming in through HLG, Hybrid Log Gamma, uh, which is another form of high dynamic range. Uh, A lot of that is 1080p resolution because that's the cameras they have. (laughs) They don't have a ton of 4K resolution cameras. We've got a whole bunch of 1080p cameras that can capture it. So uh, there is a a fair amount of 1080p high dynamic range content, most of it HLG, uh, live broadcast type of stuff. Um, So it's not that 
that it doesn't exist. Um, could I see streaming services doing it? I mean, to some extent, they already do. Uh, because, for example, Netflix, if you're having bandwidth issues with your internet connection, they will dynamically lower the resolution before uh, dropping you down from HDR to SDR. They know that you're much less likely to notice a drop in resolution all the way down to 720p. Um, you, you will notice the difference when the contrast values suddenly change on you. That'll be an abrupt jump in the image that you'll notice much more than if they dynamically just lower the resolution due to some internet traffic that's going on at the time. So there is some of that already happening in streaming services. Um, yeah, so it's mostly a marketing thing. 4K by itself probably wasn't going to do it, so they bundled it. Uh, could it be added to regular Blu-rays? That is a bigger hurdle uh, because that would mean you have to have players capable of decoding a new codec. Uh, you can't just throw it on there. It would have to come packaged inside of a new codec that all existing Blu-ray players aren't ready to decode. So that would mean getting all new players, which kind of defeats the purpose. Why not just get an Ultra HD Blu-ray player right. at that point? Because we're already there. So that one is a little bit more tricky. But the other ones, it's like, it is already happening. Uh, they, they realize that, yeah, you can have HDR without the resolution being 4K. They are two separate things. Junior in Montreal. Junior has been using an NVIDIA Shield to play back the movies he has backed up onto his NAS. He noticed that if you played the actual Blu-ray disc using a PS5, the sound quality was different with the physical disc sounding better. He figured it must have been down to how he backed up those discs, but then he noticed that if he used the VLC media player on his Shield rather than Cody, which is what he normally uses, then things sounded better, although he still thought the physical disc sounded best of all. And he saw some reviews of Zido, Zidu 9X Android TV Media Player, which rolls off the tongue. Right. So he gave that a try and thought it sounded better than anything the NVIDIA Shield had ever put out, although still marginally worse than the physical desk. <laughs> he is marginally worse. He is confused why there is such a dispar uh, disparity as far as playing the backed up discs from his NAS. It's always the same file. He says he set his NVIDIA Shield in his new Zidu 9X to bitstream output and not to do the audio decoding and processing themselves. So how can there be this difference in what he's hearing? Rob, do the, do the thing. So, I mean, uh, this is a case of the, there's a few too many variables for us to give any sort of yeah. concrete answer. Uh, I mean, the biggest of which is, yeah, how did you back up those discs? Because, um, I mean, I'm assuming... Yeah, so let's see. NVIDIA Shield, he's playing... I mean, Cody and, and VLC have the capability, uh, Cody through plugins and VLC natively, to play back just the uh, full backup of the disc where you didn't do any conversion to MKV or anything. You just did the straight backup and you just get a BDMV folder structure and you can play directly out of that um, with those players. If it were Plex, then I would know for sure that you can had converted to MKV. And if these are perhaps actually downloads rather than discs you actually own and backed up yourself, then who knows what audio format is actually on there. But if we're working on the assumption that he actually converted these to MKVs, then I don't know exactly what audio format you really have in those files. By default, uh, you know, if you didn't carefully go through any of the checkboxes when converting to MKV, you might not have the lossless file that was on the physical disk. You might have the core file, the lossy right. Dolby Digital or the lossy DTS file. Uh, which by default are always checked, but the lossless version isn't always necessarily uh, checked there. So it's possible you're playing the lossy file from those backups, particularly if they actually were downloads rather than ones you did yourself. They very well might be that. Why would there be a difference between how VLC sounds versus how Kodi sounds on the NVIDIA Shield player? Do you really have bitstream output coming out of there? Because those players have their own settings, which are separate from the Shield's hardware settings. Right. You can set the Shield to output bitstream, which means that for the menus and for the button clicks and all of those type of things that are just the Shield hardware itself producing sounds, it'll just output the bitstream. But for the players themselves, they have options inside of those apps for how the audio is handled. So there's a variable that I don't know. I don't know for certain that it really was just a straight bitstream output. Is there also the possibility that you do have the lossless files backed up in there, uh, but when you're bitstreaming out, 
it's not able to output, say, the Atmos uh, version of it because there are sometimes limitations in the software for being able to truly bitstream out the original versus, say, doing the decoding inside of the app, which turns it into multi-channel PCM and you lose the Atmos extension or you lose the DTSX extension. That's the case in, say, Apple TV's Infuse player, where it will send out lossless in the form of multi-channel PCM, but it won't send out the Atmos extensions or the DTSX extensions. So could you hear a difference that way? You certainly could. So that's another variable that is uh, probably on the software side. That Zidu 9X player, I don't have any familiarity with it. As an Android TV media player, I would suspect it's decoding because yeah. I don't know of too many that will actually just output the bitstream. They almost always decode uh, themselves. So that one I question rather highly. Um, I, I would expect that that one actually is doing decoding in there and not just giving you the straight bitstream. So Multiple variables that could explain why audible differences really exist, not the least of which is any of these could be applying gain to the signal. Right. And you will notice a difference in volume way before you notice anything else. Uh, you might not be aware that there's a difference in volume happening, but that is actually the most likely scenario of hearing a genuinely audible noticeable difference is that there was some gain applied to the signal at some point. The most likely of which being that Zidune <laughs> Android player because it probably is decoding and applying gain itself and everyone goes, ooh, it sounds better. Nah, it's just louder. Uh, and that is very often the case. So that's my suspe suspects for why this is happening to you. Okay. Uh, let's do one more and then we'll be done. Yeah. Uh, oh, wait. I scrolled up. Daniel. <laughs> Daniel has a 7.2.4 config speaker configuration set up in his living room. The theater area is about 14 feet from front to back and 14 and a half feet wide and just under 8 feet high, which means nothing because it's in the living room. Yeah. His main seat is about 3 feet from the back wall, 11 feet from the front wall. He's using SVS speakers all around, ultra center, ultra bookshelves for front, left, and right, and surrounds. Oh, and the ultra bookshelves yeah, for surrounds ultra as bookshelves well. Yeah, ultra bookshelves for surrounds as well, yeah. Six prime elevation speakers for surround backs and four overheads plus a pair of SB3000 subs. He initially had his front left and right speakers only six feet apart directly on either side of his TV. He had already determined that he needs to widen that distance probably to 10 feet apart instead of six. But prior to widening his front left and right speakers, he followed Dolby Atmos speaker diagram and mounted four of his oops, prime elevation speakers on the ceiling only six feet apart. And since there isn't yep. a ton of <laughs> space behind the seats onto the back wall, he put his top rear speakers basically two feet behind the seats with the top front speakers four feet in front of his seats he knows he's going to need to widen the distance between all of his overhead speakers now so since they're moving anyways should he could he also move the top front speakers farther forward you're gonna move the farther forward okay his That's uh the receiver is a yamaha rx 8 a 8 a God, I hate this receiver. Easy to pronounce. Yeah, and he's found that when it's it comes to up mixing 5.1 and 7.1 soundtracks, he actually prefers the Oro 3D Oromatic up mixer over Dolby Surround or DTS Neural X. So he's wondering if having his overhead speakers in positions closer to what Oro recommends will give him a better <laughs> overall listening experience. Blah 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 blah. blah. <laughs> um, Basically, so, can I have front heights and what is almost more like top, top middles? middles. And the answer honest, is you can, because you I do. You can? <laughs> I mean, I would rename them if you're going to do that, and then you're going to notice that I don't think they sound as good. Uh, okay, so I have a real huge, generally speaking, I have a huge <laughs> problem with people who are like, I really like this one up mixer, should I optimize my uh, speaker configuration for that up mixer? And the answer is, if you've already got your speakers in a particular location and you prefer one up mixer, is it because of where your speakers currently are or is it because of the, the up mixer? Because mm. to me, it, it could be either. And by moving your speakers, you might find that you now like a different up mixer more than you like that yep. one because, could, could of, happen. because of how you move your speakers. Um, so, okay. So generally speaking, <laughs> you know, Dol Dolby now has, has changed their di their recommendations a number of times. Yeah. Uh, it, the, although it just the diagrams still very much make it look like this, right? All yeah. the overhead speakers in a line, the same distance apart from left to right as your front speakers. The diagrams still very much look like that. But if you read the language in their white paper, there's uh, a greater range that uh, Dolby allows for those overhead positions. Right. So, you, you know... Are you within that right now? You probably are, as far as width, yeah. fit, width wise. 
Uh, Although, I mean, I will grant you, only six feet from left to right, yeah, not, uh, there's a good chance that that's not even as wide as your couch, uh, quite possibly. Um, yeah. So, I mean, our, our our general recommendation is when it comes to positioning Atmos speakers, uh, we, Tom and Rob, are much less strict than a lot of the other online people who want to nail down very specific angles and distances between things and proclaim that that is the only way to experience Atmos. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we are quite the opposite. We're like, look at your seats, look at yeah. your couch, make sure the speakers are a little wider apart than the couch, because everybody who's on the seat is supposed to notice that it's to the left or to the right. So if I'm sitting in the leftmost seat of my couch, I don't want the top front left speaker to be making sounds from my right. <laughs> that isn't going to be correct. Now, granted, if you have some seats that are way over to the side of the room, we're ignoring those seats. We're talking about like a three-seater couch centered in your room. Have the speakers a little wider apart than that and have them in front of and behind of those seats. That right. would be our goal. Um like my inclination is, I'm not a big fan of front heights. Yeah, As uh, someone even though who has them, I too yes. am not a fan of front heights. <laughs> they if just it were become... me, I, I I thought when I was reading your question that you were going to ask yeah. if you sh if you could move your front speakers closer to you, mm. in which I would have said that is a great idea. You should do that. Eh, yeah, you know? I mean, only four feet in front of you and prime elevations that are angled on your ceiling. Like, yeah, I would probably leave them there. Like you've got a slightly lower than eight foot ceiling. Yeah. So I don't really think I would move them forward or back from that position. I would consider if this were a different receiver, relabeling them right. as front heights and rear heights. But you don't really have to do that with a Yamaha because they just call them all presence speakers. Right. <laughs> so they're just front presence and rear presence no matter what. And they work with all the up mixers when they're labeled that way. So you don't you don't really need to do anything except maybe widen their distance. I'm just, I'm not a gigantic fan of using the front height physical positions. I'm a fan of using the label, but yeah. not so much the physical positions because they just become very unnoticeable when yeah. they're up there high on your front walls, essentially. They become very difficult to notice in any sort of significant way, in my experience, anyway. I would rather have them more or less above me and just a little bit in front of me. And you're already about where I think they should go. So, yeah, maybe widen I think them, we, but I, I wouldn't I, move them forward. Yeah, I don't think I would move those. I definitely wouldn't move them to be more in line with the Oro 3D locations. Right. Um, I don't see how that's going to help you out at all. But, well, it's uh, because, you know, the, everything in Oro 3D is heights, right? 30-degree elevation yeah. angles directly above existing speakers. I just, I don't know. The experience of, of the front height speakers is just really disappointing. It feels like a waste of money having put speakers there in, in my experience. I, yeah, I just don't notice them. I don't notice yeah. them at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm with, I mean, yeah. 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 <laughs> all right, Rob, who do we have left? Okay, uh, Andrew from AV Gadgets. He's on the list. Uh, we've got uh, Raf with a pretty fun question there. It's too bad if you're going to miss that next week because oh, we'll you see. would have had some ranting to do about that. And uh, John, I think that's it, right? Yep, those three questions are on the list for next week. All right, we want to thank our listeners for the week. We want to thank 139 patrons over at patreon.com. And we want to thank Travis and Julian for giving me permission to use their photos on AV Gadgets. That is correct. Patreon.com slash AV Rant Podcast is where you can go to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation, minimum of a dollar a month. So a big thanks to our 139 patrons over there for your financial support. And Travis and Julian, thank you for giving permission for Tom to use your photos on AVGadgets.com. That's right. We also got some notes of gratitude from JD, Toke, uh, Travis, Julian, Donald Jr., and Daniel. Thank you for thanking us. Yeah, thank you, J.D. Toke, Travis, Julian, Donald Jr., who's a separate person. It's not Donald Jr., it's Jr., yeah. just Sorry. goes by that. And Daniel, that's okay. <laughs> and uh, thank you all very much for your notes of gratitude and encouragement. They're very much appreciated. And a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. Yeah, and once you get your question answered, all you have to do is ask yes by emailing us at question at avrant.com. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com.
This is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.